think uh, I think we'll start right now. Um, I know the town manager is having some technical difficulties it, trying to figure out it would be only for, um, everything right now. It's, it's for certain. Um, <laughs> we will begin the um, town council meeting for Tuesday, February 18th. Councillor Flanagan, if you would lead us in Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you, Councillor. Dolores, are you all set down there? Yes. Councillor Moore and Dawes. Here. Councillor Flanagan. Here. Councillor Flores. Here. Councillor Hill. Here. Councillor Parker. Here. Councillor Pelletier. Here. Councillor Penelo. Here. Deputy Mayor Marzarella. Here. And Mike Mayor Michael Will. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores. Uh, we are honored uh, tonight to have uh, our three of our four members of the uh, Weathersfield Legislative Delegation here. Uh, I know you guys have been, you know, busy up in Hartford for the last couple of weeks. Session started uh, just about two weeks ago, and it's a short session, so I know everything's kind of cramped. Uh, I think we told you uh, um, we'd like to get you guys in and out of here as quick as possible. I know uh, the next couple of days got a full plate on your schedule so um, you know we do appreciate you guys coming spending some time uh, with us tonight uh, you know m maybe our senior member of the delegation uh, Russ if you wanna you're comfortable being in the uh, the town hall you, you know you were here before uh, if you want to start and uh, you know have uh, uh, Senator Lesser and Representative Wood join you up there we'd appreciate it and by senior I mean most veteran <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor, Town Councilors, members of the public. Uh, as, as the Mayor said, I'm Russ Morin, State Representative, serving the 28th District, most of Weathersfield. Uh, you're right, it feels good to be in this room. So uh, I, I think at this point, uh, from my perspective, I was very much interested in some of the things um, you wanted to bring to us, is how it's affecting the relationship between the town and the state. Uh, as you know, we, uh, the last year, this coming fiscal year, it's, Senator Fon Farah, right here, excellent. So we have the full delegation. Um, you know, Weathersfield did did pretty well as far as in the state budget for town aid. I believe this fiscal year was up a little over six hundred and fifty thousand dollars from the previous year. And since this is a, a short session and our budget is pretty much set with just adjustments, I don't anticipate any anything um, <laughs> negative. Uh, you know, if there is anything that comes out. The four of us will be working hard to make sure that that doesn't happen uh, to the best of our abilities. Um, I'll introduce my housemate, Carrie Woods, who's here and is uh, stepping right in and really knows knows uh, how to work through that building, and that's important for the town of Weathersfield. She also has a couple other towns <laughs> she has to deal with. <laughs> Great. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I just would like to say that um, it is a short session, so we're really doing some budget adjustments, and uh, we are also working in committees on some great bills. I, I'm actually really excited to hear what Senator Lesser has to say. Um, I'm on finance with Senator John Fonfara, who is chair, and I'm also on commerce. And uh, one of the bills that we're working on in commerce is um, working with Advanced CT, and um, which is combining the DECD and CERC. And it's a, a jobs bill that really gets more people coming to Connecticut or staying in Connecticut and pays off student loans. So um, it's a great way to put Connecticut on an even uh, keel with other cool, cool areas like Austin and Nashville and San Francisco. Um, but there's, there's really great stuff happening in committees which will benefit uh, towns and taxpayers. And um, I'll pass it over to Senator Lesser. Thank you, uh, Mayor Alp, members of the council. It's uh, good to be here. Uh, uh, my colleagues mentioned a, a few different things. I just want to underscore last year uh, in the budget, we were able to get a modest increase on ECS funding for the town of Wethersfield. Uh, you know, the, given the last uh, few years, uh, any increase is uh, uh, certainly something that we're grateful for. And another thing I know that was concerning to the town, the uh, proposed cost shift of teacher pensions onto municipalities was something we were able uh, to avoid doing. So those were two big uh, wins for the town of Wethersfield. 
Uh, right now we're looking, as, as uh, Representative Morin said, at uh, largely a, a, a sort of a static budget for the next, uh, for the next year, maybe a, a, another modest increase. We're, we're still looking uh, at that. Um, I'm the chair of the Insurance uh, and Real Estate Committee, so I'm really focused on the subject of health care. Uh, you probably saw some of the coverage of uh, one of the bills that I'm working on, which is to cap the cost of insulin uh, for patients who have it at $50 a month and $100 uh, for supplies for uh, type 1 diabetics in the state. That could be a big deal. Um, working on a lot of other health care related issues as well, but I'm on seven different committees, so I'm probably working on whatever other issues you care about as well, uh, one way or the other uh, when I have time to sleep. But uh, I do represent about a quarter of the town of Wethersfield. Uh, Senator from Faro represents the other three quarters, and so uh, very happy to learn from him uh, uh, the ropes of the state senate. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's true it's a budget year, but um, that never stopped us. Um, the calendar is two months shorter, but we cram everything in to the same amount of time, and a lot less time, I should say. Um, who knows what's going to happen this year? I mean, we have a governor who's different, I'll put it that way, um, and uh, still trying to find his way, I think, and his staff. It makes it difficult for us. It's completely different than the previous, the previous governor or governors. But the last governor was a very active governor, as you know, whether you agree with him or not. Um, he and his, his team were um, hit the ground running. I guess it helps when you have had municipal experience, as he did, something like 13 years or so as mayor, 15 years as mayor of Stanford. This governor has had none of that, and it shows. So it's been very difficult, very difficult for me, I'll speak for myself, uh, to, to adjust to someone who really doesn't have much of an agenda that he's come in with. Um, you don't hear anything about an urban agenda or, I mean, they talk about wanting to get the state going again, but I don't know what that means in terms of their vision for it. The, the, uh, his commissioner of DECD's uh, plan is not impressive in my opinion. We'll, we'll try to work with him on it, but uh, it doesn't excite me and it shouldn't excite you, um, unfortunately. But um, I think that there's, you know, every session, even though we say it's a short session, we say it's an election year session, we sort of pull in our horns. But hey, uh, it's, uh, we're elected to do a job and it's, uh, we have two shots at it every term and we ought to be as serious about it in the second year as we are in the first year, even though that always doesn't happen. So, um, you know, I, my priority again this year, as it's been the last several, is uh, one of them anyway, is property tax reform. Weathersfield now is at or near 41. In my opinion, that's, I know that's not popular to say here, but it's true. It's the canary in the coal mine. That's the, that's the edge that says, you know, People, do they want to live and in, uh, move into Wethersfield? They make decisions about these things and what the town is able to provide. I think whether it be Democrat or Republican, um, Wethersfield has been a wonderfully well-managed town as long as I've been representing it for 20, going, this is my 24th year. Um, however, um, you get you, you practically get blood from a stone in terms of getting everything you can from the tax dollars that the taxpayers pay. You can't, it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable and you need help. And the state has to step up and provide additional resources, which we have not been able to change. We can't get the state to give up one dime. And when it does, it pulls it back generally within six months to a year. Makes it very tough for local taxpayers and, and you as officials of the town. And we have to break this paradigm. We'll keep at it and, uh, and we'll see if we can move it, the needle this session. Thanks. Thank you, Senator. Um, I'll open it up for some questions from counselors. If anybody's got any questions for uh, the delegation, Councilor Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I wanted to, uh, I don't know if piggyback's the right word, but I want to address something that uh, Senator Lesser brought up about health care. I happen to be the chair of a much smaller insurance committee here, in, not the chair, the liaison, I should say, 
Uh, and we are seeing from an operating budget, our health insurance and dr the drug and, and health at 8, 10, 12% year over year over year. A few years ago, it was a little bit better, but now it's sort of back into that scale. Is there anything that we can do either as a town, support you and, you know, and the delegation, the bills, in order to start to normalize that cost, if it's with the cost of living, or even if it's on the drug side and not the care side or something in some way, how can we start to normalize this? Because obviously if we're looking at whatever the tax rate might be, 2%, 3% it is, it's not the 8, 10, 12s that we're looking at. And healthcare makes up such a large part of our budget that we're struggling with ways, whether it's collaborating with other towns, I don't know, uh, finding different ways for drug, pre drug, drug prescription medication. You handle these things at the state capitol on a daily, you know, daily basis. Um, we're more vol volunteer here, but we'd like to some uh, guidance as to how we can start to normalize our health costs from a budgetary standpoint. Well, if I if I had an easy answer to that, Councilman Forrest, I would be in another line of work. Um, but uh, no, you're, it's a it's a it's a challenge across uh, both the state. Uh, side of municipalities and of course uh, private employers and families across the state are seeing uh, these huge increase in healthcare costs and so um, there are a number of things that I can say so I, I, on the specific side uh, we you know we do have the the state's partnership plan as an opportunity for municipalities to uh, purchase a version of the same health care that we all receive as state legislators whether or not that makes fiscal sense for the town of Wethersfield uh, we can talk about uh, perhaps offline and it depends on your circumstances and same thing piggybacking on uh, the state's uh, pharmacy benefit manager contract that we've just negotiated uh, but the bigger question is we've seen increases in the cost of health care that are just simply unsustainable it goes way up, uh, up way faster uh, than inflation uh, and it's eating up a larger and larger percentage of public dollars. Um, earlier this year, uh, the governor signed an executive order trying to replicate something that's worked in Massachusetts. And what they did there is they set a benchmark. Uh, they set a goal for uh, inflation in um, across the healthcare landscape. Uh, they were focused there just on hospitals. If we're looking at everything uh, and saying we're gonna set a target uh, for healthcare cost growth. And if drug prices or hospitals or insurance or anything else exceeds that cost growth, we're gonna hold hearings on it. We're gonna try to shed a light uh, and try to find out why uh, those costs are growing. Now, you, it's tempting to be cynical and say, well, what, what is a hearing and, and transparency going to do to control costs? Well, I'm not sure exactly how this works, but in Massachusetts, since 2013, it saved uh, taxpayers over five billion dollars in healthcare costs. Their their rate of cost growth has slowed simply by getting everybody in a room to talk about why costs are growing. Uh, that's something we're going to be replicating in Connecticut uh, starting this year. Uh, we've got to we've got to set the the benchmark and get that data from folks. But it's something that may very well uh, yield results. And and you're absolutely right. The the biggest cost driver is the growth of uh, pharmaceutical drugs costs. Um, and we've got a whole bevy of approaches that we're going to be rolling out this year, including bringing in safe, affordable Canadian prescription drugs to try to control that particular cost driver uh, and do it in a way that's responsible and, and, and hopefully will we'll benefit towns. Well, if there's any way that we can assist or mm -hmm. keep us informed, or at least I can keep the, our insurance committee informed as we develop our budget and you know look for ways in which to improve the cost effectiveness of our care. A absolutely. Thank you. I will Thank do that. Thank you, Senator. You know, if I can follow up, <clears throat> Representative, on, on many issues, regardless of what the issues are that are affecting the town, it's important for us to have dialogue. I, that's why I appreciated uh, the mayor inviting us here. I think it's it's good for us to to hear. We this is our our town too, and it's sometimes I always say uh, my office is seven miles away from my driveway, but I might as well be in Siberia because people from Wethersfield typically don't make the journey to the capital, whereas they come here. So uh, the discussion back and forth, the town managers, uh, very good when there's a specific issue that comes to, you know, that the state might have an effect on, he'll reach out to us. But same thing, uh, you should all feel free when there's things that are going on to, to, to reach out. That's, and vice versa. I mean, that's that's why we're, we're all here. So uh, just to piggyback on that comment, I, I welcome that from all of you. Thank you, Russ. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. Anybody else with any questions at all? Uh, uh, thank you, Mayor. 
Uh, just to piggyback on the insulin bill you were talking about, now I had seen the original bill that had passed and I understand it's a placeholder bill, um, but that did strike up in my opinion a lot of fear and concern and I just generally would like to see people at the state capitol kind of get away from that practice. Um, you know, I, I get that's not the specific language and you weren't actually, you were trying to cap it and not tax it, but, um, you know, unless there's specific language, it doesn't feel very open and transparent. Um, and, and the second issue I wanted to bring up, I know you guys were sick of, of talking about it, but tolls. Um, you know, this last fall, obviously, we all campaigned very hard and kind of the common theme that I came across at least was that enough was enough and people are willing to contribute for services, but these are tough times. Um, so as far as, you know, for example, the Rhode Island lawsuit, I know the governor of Rhode Island has said that they're confident, but you rarely see somebody in a legal case tell the press that they're not confident. Um, so is there a plan as far as if they lose the lawsuit, um, will cars, you know, passenger cars be tolled? Um, I know there was a legal loophole uh, I think it was Section 8 of the bill that had uh, caused some concern as far as I think within two years uh, the, the wording of the bill could be changed to include passenger cars. So, um, you know, I had, I had tried to, to do some research and um, really the political side was addressed a lot more than the legal side. Yeah. And I personally am, am just worried because we've gone from truck only tolls to 85 tolls, including cars, to 50 tolls, inc including cars, back to truck only tolls. So I, I'm just struggling to understand what exactly is the plan here. Sure, so I'll, I'll, I'll address the first part because I think that was addressed to me. The, we announced at the beginning of the year uh, that the top priority of the state Senate Democrats was this insulin uh, proposal. We said exactly what we were planning on doing. Uh, and then we held a press conference on uh, Thursday of last week to outline the details. I think in the interim, there was a attempt to play some political games on, on Facebook. It wasn't anything more than that uh, by people who were trying to mislead what was in the bill. But we had been consistent uh, from the outset about what we were trying to do, which was to cap insulin prices. Uh, the text of that bill will be available. It's a 22-page bill. It'll be available online tomorrow. Uh, Go on the CGA website, type in Senate Bill 1, you'll be able to read it. Um, now, with regard to the, the tolling proposal that's that's out there, um, you know, a senator from Farah, I think, was, was accurate when he was talking about our frustration. And uh, when you campaign on something, you're supposed to deliver on what you were campaigning on. And that was a frustration, I think, for, for many of us. Um, my understanding from reading the bill and reading Section 8 and all that is if there's a proposal down the line to change that, that has to come back before the General Assembly, and that would require a vote. Now, that that vote may be in two years, but you'll be able to, if you know, if you don't like something that we do down the line, you'll have the opportunity to vote us out. One quick follow-up. Have you guys, I, I don't know, I saw Mark Davis today had reported that uh, the 18th today, so obviously not today, but the 19th or the 20th, or potential dates for a vote on this bill. Um, do you guys have any knowledge of A, a vote date, and B, do you have hard numbers? Because I've seen reports of the entries could range between six and $13. Do you guys know exact specifics yet, or are you still? <laughs> no, I don't believe, I don't believe there will be a vote this week. Um, there, I had heard possibly Thursday, but I don't believe that's the case. And every plan I've seen has been I believe 12 okay. uh, truck only tolls. And I think one thing to follow up with what uh, Senator Lesser said, the, if it does, if it were to be implemented, if, and if it were to come back where somebody wanted to add cars, it would still have to pass by, I believe, 60% of the legislature. Is that, do you recall the language? I believe it's, it's a number, of not, not just a majority. It has to go through uh, possibly two thirds of the legislature to pass any changes. And the F Federal Highway Administration would have to be on board. I mean, it's, you're, I, I think you're right, uh, Counselor, when you, when you talk about you know, the frustration of the plan moving. Because I know the governor's people were down in DC working with the Federal Highway Administration and the president's transportation people, and, and it's, it's kind of been a moving target for all of us. So your concerns are not, uh, not ill-founded. I understand that. Thank you. 
I'd just like say that the issue of tolls is more or less uh, sort of a, uh, it's, it's, I think it affects people more uh, than the issue itself of tolls. I don't know. I mean, who wants to pay 100% to maintain our road system when we can pay 60%? I, I don't know of anybody who has a problem with that equation. And that's what we're talking about here is, you know, people, I drove down to Baltimore this summer. I went through I don't know how many tolls and uh, paid in every state that I went to, uh, came back and paid them again, got on a Merritt Parkway and had a car from New York and New Jersey go by me and I said, they're not gonna pay a dime in this state. But I just paid in their state and a lot of others. <coughs> Makes no sense. The issue is that, and the frustration that people have is that we are paying off liabilities that even my predecessors, and I've been there a long time, as you know, did not live up to. They did not, they weren't responsible. And so we're paying for that. 53% of every dollar in, in revenue that the state raises goes right to unfunded liabilities, fixed costs, 53% and rising, and rising. Now we've taken some steps to slow that down, but it's real. And so that leads to how do you run government? How do you, how do, you do the things necessary? And I don't care, again, I said it before, I don't care who's in charge, the same issues exist. So um, we're, we're taking major steps. We've taken steps regarding the budget reserve fund. You know this, we're now at nearly $3 billion for the first time. It's the biggest a surplus or, or a reserve fund we've ever had. That will help us in a lot of ways, the next recession, and it will come. Um, we won't have to cut as much. We won't have to raise revenue uh, as much, and hopefully if it's an average recession, we won't have to do either of those things. And it will prepare us better for when we come out of it. We'll be in better shape than other states will because their budget reserve funds are not what ours are. But we're still facing this fixed cost dilemma that was not created by us, but we have to face it. And if we push it off further to our children and grandchildren, we'll be doing what they did. Um, I, was, I was not in favor of, of um, extending it out as long as we have. I would rather have waited longer, a few more years. That would have had a better impact in terms of the amortization of this. Um, I didn't prevail in that issue, but um, I think the more we can take, it's, it's like anything else. If you have bad credit, if you bite the bullet and deal with it now, you're in better shape later. But we're, po we're politicians, we want to get reelected, and so we do what we can right now to make people happy, but it doesn't bode well for our children or grandchildren if we keep doing that. So that's, that's what leads to the toll debate. That's what leads to the frustration of people, and it's r they're right to be frustrated, but we're paying for past sins. We all are right now, and we'll continue to do that, unfortunately, for some years to come. And just to piggyback, one last time, um, in, in doing some research for this, um, the Office of Fiscal Analysis on, uh, you know, on their report on the budget, on page 32 uh, stated that $170 million was diverted from the fund that, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, would be the fund that the transportation money would go to. So, you know, that's, that's part of my, what, my what? personal frustration. What's that? When? I could get it for you, but it's the Office of Fiscal Analysis, House Bill 7424, page 32. Okay. Yeah, so the um, Office of Policy Management uh, did an exhaustive review of this idea that the uh, reason the transportation fund is insolvent is because, you know, this, this is that notion out there uh, that, uh, or not, not insolvent, but is, uh, it faces the structural deficit because there's been continuous rating of the transportation fund uh, and found that that's actually not the case. You know, in the last few years, and, and, and Senator from Far Eyes, uh, certainly aware of it, uh, we've, we've been rating the general fund to prop up the special transportation fund. We've been transferring uh, sales tax revenues, uh, uh, an increasing uh, amount to prop up the special transportation fund uh, because of the same issues that every other state is going through, which is uh, the gas prices have been flat, our gas taxes 
flat. Our gas revenues are, are up if slightly, then they're, they're, they're mostly flat. Uh, and meanwhile, costs go up every single year. Uh, and this is not something that's unique to Connecticut. Every other state is going through the exact same thing. Uh, and so what we've been doing is we've been taking funding that should be going to the town of Wethersfield uh, to provide for property tax relief, should be going to schools, should be going to basic services and health care. And instead, we're taking it out of the general fund to prop up the special transportation fund. I think the one time, I think that was there was a significant diversion of funding the other direction was, I think, in 2003, which was before I got elected and before uh, most of us up here were serving, uh, and that was during a during a recession uh, in one particular time. O otherwise, it's been the diversion's gone the other direction. Well, I I'd be happy to email it to you, but unless I was misunderstanding the language, um, it wasn't that the money was in the fund and being taken out; it was that the money was being diverted before it ever got there. Was how I understood. I think that may be a follow-up question offline if you wanted to yeah. follow up with the legislators. Anybody else? Nicholas, Mike. <clears throat> I just want to echo Senator Fonferra's comments about that the current methodology of property taxes is unsustainable and anything you guys can do to help us um, doesn't have to be monetary. If there's regulations or things you can do to free up our ability to be more strategic with our staff, uh, sharing with towns, that would be much appreciated. Definitely appreciate that. Thank you. Um, um, yes. I just, um, w MDC was here a couple weeks ago talking to us about their proposed integrated plan and they have encouraged us and other member towns to, uh, you know, talk to you guys and to try to, you know, get deep to either uh, you know, relax some of the mandates or accept the integrated plan or, you know, if there's anything they can do because there's such a big financial burden on the MDC member towns. Is there anything that you guys are doing or could do on our behalf and as, you know, representatives of MDC member towns? Well, you know, <coughs> um, this is a tough one. I'll, I'll be quick because I'm sure others would like to speak, but look, um, we all voted for this, many of us, when this was put before us, and, and now it's time to pay the piper. What's wrong about it is that um, the, the pace of implementation, uh, which is causing such increases, uh, who doesn't want clean water? Who doesn't want clean air? I don't think there's anybody here who doesn't want that. But Springfield's not doing it, New Haven's not doing it, Waterbury's not doing it, we're the only ones and we're doing it at a much quicker pace than maybe we should have. And that's maybe, I think that's the path we need to look at is how to slow down the pace. Doesn't mean we stop, means we slow it down. So the cost, the impact is, is, is less. That's, that's real. Um, but you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that we have stepped up when no other community has. No other community has. And um, you know, I personally feel that this should be more than the Connecticut River, this resource, this national resource that we have, natural and national resource that we have, is a Connecticut treasure. It's not just a eight-member town treasure. Now, the state is contributing, the federal government's contributing, but I think they could do more. But at minimum, we need to work, I believe, at slowing down the pace of the implementation so that, that uh, ratepayers are not hit as hard and the towns are not hit as hard. Um, and if there are other things legislatively that we can do to help MDC, you know, resolve these issues, uh, I did meet with their uh, team the other day talking about the integrated plan. And yes, all of those things are on the table to explore um, and find ways to relieve the, you know, burden of these excessive uh, increases on ratepayers. Um, and then, of course, we're always asking some outside the box thinking: What's the next thing? What's um, you know, what are we doing to either slow the plan down or extend bonding from a 20-year to a 30-year um, payout? So we have been having discussions with them, and it's uh, a priority to make sure that uh, these 10, 11 percent, followed by a 14 percent increase, uh, don't continue. Because not only is it, you know, a burdensome for us um, that are paying water bills, but you know, the town buildings are paying this. Um, we have a lot of housing, you know, authorities that are paying this, and it's just unsustainable um, as it's currently mo moving forward. Councilor Thal. 
I'd like to just thank you all for coming tonight and I appreciate the um, service that you do for the community and the advocacy to bring the funding back to us, um, especially last year we did get additional funding from the state that um, was really instrumental in making a budget that we could all live with on the town side. So thank you for all your work you do for Weathersfield. Thank you. Can I just say one on that part? Uh, the governor, as you know, has championed this term debt diet. I don't believe in it. <clears throat> um, uh, many, most towns cannot afford to bond and do the things that are necessary. Weathersfield's been a beneficiary of a significant amount over the years of bonding from the state. And um, that fight will continue. They say they're going to relax it. We'll see. But there are a lot of things that this town needs that that help from the state in terms of bonding um, uh, would, 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 uh, would help with greatly and we'll continue that fight to ensure that Weathersfield gets its fair share. Thank you. It's good to hear. Anyone else? Okay, well I'll be remiss if I don't have an opportunity to talk to my four legislators all in captive audience right now. <laughs> uh, a lot of this, uh, what I was gonna say has already been said and I do appreciate you guys being here. Not to belabor the toll uh, debate at all, but uh, one thing you know, dear, near and dear to my heart for the town of Wethersfield is, I know the gantries are set at you know different areas throughout the state, mostly in southwestern Connecticut, uh, 95 corridor, and some down near London Way. If at all the plan changes, and um, you know that you're looking or the governor's looking at 91, you know, into Hartford from the southbound, or you know, out of Hartford from you know, going southbound or going northbound. You know, Weathersfield is unfortunately in a prime location when it comes to, you know, collecting toll revenue for those going into the, to the city. Uh, everybody has GPS nowadays on their phones and it's not too hard to click an app and just divert right to either the Burrow and Turnpike further south of us or directly onto the Silesfine Highway. We are seeing it right now uh, with the construction that's going on just south of Hartford and uh, you know, and so much so that the DOT has changed the light patterns on the Silestine Highway so that that traffic can flow much faster going northbound uh, into Hartford during rush hour. Uh, I just don't know what that congestion would be like when, uh, when and if uh, a toll gantry is ever put up in the you know Weathersfield area on 91. So just keep that in mind. I know, I've, you know, a lot of people have talked to you guys about that. Um, thank you, Councillor uh, Pelletier, about the MDC. Uh, definitely the integrated plan. You know, we've had that conversation going for a while now. Uh, MDC started it about a year ago. You know, we're working on it. I know Representative Wood, you've got Newington, Rocky Hill, and Weathersfield, all three towns uh, that are involved, uh, member towns of MDC. I'm sure you are, you're hearing it as well. Uh, I have them too. Yeah, and you do too, and in, in Hartford as well. I mean, y you guys all have MDC towns. You're hearing from your local, you know, elected officials as well as your, um, um, residents on that so you know we appreciate your hard work on that mm -hmm. and then finally and this is to go along similar to the MDC concern we're hearing um, <coughs> it would, it's been grumbling for a little while now but Mira uh, I as well uh, these are all fixed costs that we as a you know not only as you know ratepayers ourselves but as a, you know the, the municipality as a whole have to absorb in the cost um, you know talking with uh, representative Morin earlier today the latest and greatest thing 20 years ago were you know curbside single stream recycling it was the best thing in, in the world prices now have have dropped so much so that they're not even taking recycled materials um, you know the the conflicts going on between U the United States and China have actually been cost prohibitive for us to, to sell to those folks so you know we kind of find ourselves in a quandary with Mira up in in Hartford and, and an aging plant that is from you know I think before the the De Great Depression of the 1930s, 20s, and 30s. We need to uh, modernize that system or change how that how it's going to be done. Uh, I know the legislature's energy committee, and I don't know Senator Fonfair if you're still on energy, but I know uh, mm -hmm. Senator Lester's on mm -hmm. energy. Um, that is one issue that you know we need to to solve soon. Otherwise, uh, tipping fees. We've mentioned it before in this <coughs> the council. Uh, could go upwards of $145 a ton. We're at 81 right now, 83? 83. 83, I'm sorry. Going up possibly to 91, 95. That's, that's where I got my one from. Uh, so any way to keep that cost down, uh, DEP, 
need in the state needs to uh, you know look at investing in that um, power plant either take it completely offline and change how it's done or you know a modern upgrade for it if I could say briefly that representing both Hartford and Wethersfield um, I have fought Mira CRA for a lot of years uh, they have uh, more than nine lives they've got 99 lives uh, but um, I that plant needs to be shut down. Uh, it does not belong on the river, this great resource. Whether it's, there's another facility, smaller one in Hartford remains to be seen or however this new RFP will be written and responded to, I think there needs to be some creative people at the table to find ways that relieve towns of, of what is projected to be substantial increases in cost, but also relieve the city of Hartford. Uh, we've done our bit. Uh, more than um, than I want to say, and the children and others of, of Hartford, and I would say the surrounding areas of Wethersfield as well in terms of the emissions from that plant, asthma rates being astronomical in Hartford um, uh, for, for the reasons that are obvious. Uh, but um, uh, this is a statewide problem, Mayor, and it needs to be addressed statewide, but I'm hoping that towns don't take what, you know, just a simple route of how can I keep that plant going? Another, that's the plan that Mira's put forward. I oppose it um, to just uh, reinvest in a, an aging but a, an obsolete facility mm -hmm. that should have been shut years ago. So I hope that um, you folks can, on your end, be vocal in that regard. We do. Thanks. We plan on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Well, without any further ado, we do appreciate you guys coming. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having us. <clears throat> Amy, did we get our uh, technical difficulties fixed? Okay. <laughs> yep. We have a presentation by the uh, Weathersfield Historical Society coming up. Amy, Elaine, did you want to come up as well? or? Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> She'll come up at the end. <laughs> Me to get that for you. <laughs> is it, uh, does the remote actually light up or is it? Uh, okay. Well, Amy, can you um, begin just talking a little bit about the presentation and um, what is. Um, the Historical Society and the I, work that you do. I can do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Rell, for having us here this evening. My name's Amy Whitorf. I live at 17 Center Street, and I'm here as ex Executive Director of Weathersfield Historical Society to greet our newer town council members, to give a quick overview of Weathersfield Historical Society and the services it provides for our community. Okay, it's kind of it's, it's going to be kind of hard to do without the pictures. It's mostly pictures. 
Maybe what we can talk about briefly, if you can give us uh, kind of an update on some of the activities that are going on and planned. I know the Memorial Day Parade uh, kicks off in May, and I know it's a whole heritage weekend that the um, Historical have, Society provides. We have an awful lot in store this spring. Um, on May 23rd, I believe it is, we will have our Weathersfield Heritage Weekend in the center of Old Weathersfield, we will have uh, many reenactors, horses, cannons, hopefully the boat again, um, a lot of reenactors um, uh, doing demonstrations. This year we're excited our uh, Weathersfield house tour is back. We only do this every three or four years. We have, is it eight wonderful homes? They are all in Old Weathersfield and walkable this year. And our committee is working very hard on that. Um, April 4th is our Taste of Weathersfield fundraiser. And I think Weathersfield is starting to become a bit of a foodie town. We have uh, some great restaurants that are going to be opening up soon. And we're really happy to be able to showcase some of the great um, restaurants that are available right in our community and very nearby. Um, mm -hmm. We will be having uh, our free Heaney Cooler concerts in July. Uh, we'll also, there's, Weathersfield's going to host a Fife and Drum Muster. Our own uh, Colonel Chester Fife and Drum Corps uh, is celebrating an anniversary. They're going to have an exhibit at the Keeney Center and a special concert the first Tuesday in July this year. And then we'll have three other concerts on the following Tuesdays. Our, our, hopefully we'll have our Porch Fest again as we had um, this past August. And uh, our old Weathersfield Lantern Light Tours in October. <coughs> and of course, our uh, old Weathersfield Arts and Crafts Fair will be October 5th this year. Great. Well, we do appreciate that. So. Please bear with us. I don't know. Uh -huh. oh. Paula can get it. Got one. Promise in the budget there will be enough money for double A batteries. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of them. Buy the expensive ones. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Thank you, Gary. Just dim the lights while you're over there. <coughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Weathersfield <coughs> Historical Society. Come on, move along. There we go. Um, our mission is to preserve and promote Weathersfield's history and culture to inspire people today and tomorrow. The Society was founded February 27th, 1932, 88 years ago almost, uh, next Thursday, I think, by the Weathersfield uh, Businessmen's Civic Association in order to celebrate the town's 300th anniversary. But we are not an organization that is solely focused on the distant past and colonial history. We have 400 years of history to celebrate. We believe that history happens every day. And everyone in the community helps make that history. 
Weathersfield Historical Society is the premier steward of and authority on the historical, architectural, and cultural significance of Weathersfield, Connecticut. While revering the past, Weathersfield Historical Society believes history is a living thing, ever evolving and enriching. Our commitment is to inspire and educate people from all backgrounds and cultures on a daily basis. Weathersfield Historical Society is the only institution that uses a holistic approach to engaging people with the town's bountiful historic treasures. Those who live here, once lived here, are connected to the town in other ways and the diverse public at large can easily access a full portfolio of resources. Education programs. One of them, STEM program for Silas Dean Middle School. Native American Foodways, the Family Learning Program Outreach. This is always a lot of fun. And a variety of school programs for all ages at our sites and beyond. Historic Preservation and Museums. Robert Allen Keeney Memorial Cultural Center was restored in the late 80s um, with private funds at no cost to the town. And it serves as the visitor center for the town of Wethersfield. And there's when it was a high school. And today, thanks to George Savick for that photo. The Cove Warehouse Maritime Museum is one of the few 17th century buildings that still stand in Weathersfield, and it's on the town seal. Our Hurlbut Dunham House was gifted to the society by Silas Robbins' granddaughter uh, in 1969, and it is open free of charge to the public on weekends in the summer, as is the Cove Warehouse. We offer a variety of exhibits at the Keeney Center that cover all periods of Weathersfield's history, including history that is still being made. Our permanent exhibit, our Kevin the Turkey exhibit was very popular. Oh, that didn't come out. Our uh, Connecticut State Prison exhibit, which won state and national awards. We have the all school art show every year, as well as the art league has a show and sometimes the Weathersfield Academy for the Arts. My photos are not coming through very well. It's all right. <laughs> we had a great exhibit, exhibit Holidays of Weathersfield's World that explored uh, holidays celebrated by Weathersfield residents that many people aren't familiar with. We have curated collections, research archives, and genealogical reference works. Our library assists over 400 researchers each year, free of charge, either walk-in or by email or uh, regular mail. Our website has free resources, the Burying Ground searchable database of all the burials in the ancient burying ground and uh, village cemetery. We have a section of articles from the community. I believe there's over 50 there now that span four centuries. Our collections span four centuries of Weathersfield's history mm -hmm. and we're still co collecting. We have great manuscripts, we have great photos, paintings, objects, And we have special events and year-round opportunities for community engagement. Weathersfield Heritage Weekend. Our Keeney Coolers free concerts. Lots of dancing going on there. Porch Fest we had this past year, it was great fun. Our old Weathersfield Lantern Light Tours. We just had our 10th anniversary tour this past year. And this event is largely run by volunteers. Our Holidays on Main Open House is always lots of fun. Our Herba Dunham House and Keeney Center are open. 
and we had the Hallmark filming Christmas on Honeysuckle Lane and the movie that was filmed for Lifetime this year. And we've had movie premieres at the Keeney Center. And admission free of charge, just we asked for donations for the food bank and we got some great donations. Our fundraising events, Taste of Weathersfield, the House Tour, and Arts and Crafts Fair uh, support our free programming for the community and also draw visitors into our town to patronize our local businesses. All of Weathersfield Historical Society's programming is offered free of charge or at a low cost. Weathersfield schools receive free tours and outreach programs. Admission to all of our museums and our research library is free. The Keeney Center is the town's visitor center open free of charge six days a week. And we're proud to be partners in preservation with the town of Wethersfield to serve our community. Thank you so much. And here we have our annual rent for the Cove Warehouse, which is one rope of red onions. So Mayor Rell, if you'd <laughs> come and accept the onions. I will accept them. I don't think my wife will, though. <laughs> And those uh, onions will be donated to the uh, food pantry downstairs, um, which is a, a good little plug for those. Uh, the holiday season is, is over. Everybody kind of thinks that that's the time to donate the most amount of food, but the uh, need does not stop uh, after uh, the new year. Um, please consider donating to the food bank um, all year long. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. We appreciate it. No. Um, Historical Society does a great job here in town. Um, I do want to put a little plug in for um, the work that's being done across the street. There was a, a dig that was found that uh, some of the archaeological dig uh, had found evidence that we are, in fact, older than Windsor, if I'm not mistaken. So um, in my two-year term, I do plan on retaking that claim. We, we have our paperwork yes, exactly. Yep. Great. Um, well, thank you again. We do appreciate it. Uh, I will open it up now to public comment. Uh, anybody wishing to speak? Yes. Hi, good evening. Uh, Beth yeah. Riley. <coughs> I live at 12 Hubbard Place. Hi, Let me just yep. jump in, and it's just for public uh, um, edification that screen is not working we do limit to five minutes okay. uh, so if you hear a uh, ring go off okay. it, it, we don't cut off you got one minute to go so uh, kind of oh wow I see it <laughs> it's working it, it's four minutes yeah uh, I got I see it you got five now okay there you go all right this is okay. pressure okay <laughs> keep an eye on it great thank you guys okay um, I'm here today to ask for three things uh, from our elected officials. Um, more public transparency in regard to the budget, uh, fully funding the proposed 3.66% increase in the Board of Ed budget, uh, as well as a system to incentivize more businesses to come to town. Uh, so some of these comments I'll say at Board of Ed because they kind of apply there, but I, I want uh, town council to know about them. Uh, a few years ago, I decided to get a bit more involved in politics and the school system uh, as my two daughters were entering elementary school and all politics is local, right? Uh, I was frustrated with the lack of transparency with what was going on with our local government at the time and multiple people suggested I attend the Board of Ed budget uh, meetings held at the Stillman Building. So I recently attended all three budget meetings um, Having been a special educator for the past 19 years, I have some expertise in this area. Um, while the meetings were informative, I found them more to be for clarification purposes and discussion. Um, 
I was waiting kind of for the nitty gritty of what the cuts were going to be, um, and it never happened. Uh, how can I advocate for what I think is appropriate, are, are appropriate cuts and where we should not be cutting? This did not come up at the budget meetings to my awareness, and I was at all of them. Um, I was recently uh, disappointed, to say the least, that I'm reading posts on Facebook to hear about or hear about through the grapevine about um, proposed cuts that I believe should have been talked about probably at those three budget meetings that weren't. Um, what are the cuts? Um, is this going to be? In, is the public going to be informed about these cuts? Anyway, without knowing uh, what the proposed cuts are, I want to stress that we need to continue to base our decisions around data. Data is prevalent in education field among other industries. There's always a study that's been done or a recent article uh, with what methods are best. Um, there are experts doing good research out there. We need to continue to use database decision making and thinking about the school budget. Um, in my time in Weathersfield, I found it extremely hard to be an informed citizen here. Uh, the town manager has helped with that. Thanks, Gary. Uh, whether it's Republicans or Democrats in the majority, I don't really care. Um, I just want to be informed of the goings on in our town in order to advocate for what I feel is best. Um, I attended all the budget meetings to advocate, and I still didn't, I felt, I, to say where cuts could be made, and I have expertise in this area, and why don't I know what's going on? Um, why are these meetings held behind closed doors? I'm asking for public transparency whenever possible throughout the budget process and future budget meetings. I'm asking you to fully fund the proposed 3.66% increase. It's mostly due to staff contracts, as well as one additional high school special ed teacher where their caseloads are unmanageable at 28 and 30 kids right now. Um, I'm gonna skip part, hold on, oh. <laughs> All right, uh, hold on. What we really need to do in Weathersfield is attract more businesses to town. There are way too many vacant buildings and storefronts in Weathersfield. Um, at Weathersfield needs a way to incentivize businesses to come to town. Um, as a side note, I sat in on the planning and zoning meetings for Artisanal Burger Company. They've been in the process of trying to build and plan here for two and a half years. The meeting I attended had a lawyer, an architect, a traffic engineer. They probably spent 10 grand at that one meeting. It's, it, they own the lot that they're trying to build on. Otherwise, I don't see any company putting in the time, money, and effort in that they have. After hearing everything they've gone through, there's no way I would bring my business to Weathersfield. I hope other businesses weren't paying attention to that process. In closing, I hope you hear my three points I'm trying to make here. More public transparency to create more informed citizens, approval of the 3.66% increase to the Board of Ed budget, and finally, some way to incentivize businesses to come to, to, come to our town and hopefully stay here. We can do better. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Deborah. Hi everyone, Deborah Cohen, 73 Church Street. I'm gonna lower that. So there are um, three things that I would like to tie together to make one general plea and point um, to town council. And two of them go back to a, com uh, a comment that I made here the last time um, I was up here and I would just like to briefly recap those. Um, one of the things that I uh, spoke about was my belief in the need for town council to be in communication with Gail Hardy's office regarding the um, investigation that is happening there. And another point that I made was that, to my knowledge, there had been no follow-up on the initial community conversation that was ordered to, uh, offered to residents of our town. So um, Amy was kind enough to bring me up to date on um, some information on both of those points. Um, it's my understanding that there has been some communication, although perhaps with no final resolution between Weathersfield and Gail Hardy's office. 
And also I understand that um, after the original community conversation, attempts were made to reach out to other, other folks in town and the offers were not accepted. So hold on to those two thoughts. I want to tie this into a third example of something and then make my main point. Um, we most recently heard, most of us most recently heard, through a newspaper article about the town's plan to install um, surveillance cameras. Regardless of where you fall on that argument about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, it seems to me that that sort of thing really is important enough to get lots of input and lots of feedback from town residents. So I authored that opinion on social media. And once again, Amy, thank you. <laughs> I do hear from you. Um, Amy offered that last February, in February of 2019, um, the installation of the cameras was brought up at a town council meeting. Um, no one from the audience, if we're referred to as the audience, um, spoke up to say anything about it, and it was passed that evening. So, um, I want to tie all of these th three things together. A lot of things are happening in our town, some positive, some negative, depending on your perspective, that residents simply don't know about. I would like to put forward the idea that when our town council, or specifically if our town manager is um, conferring with Gail Hardy's office, residents should know about that, even if it's to say, look, We've been in touch with the office and there's not a damn thing to report back yet because they're still sitting on it. We deserve to know that this communication is happening. Um, same thing with the attempt to expand the community conversations. You've got a lot of people who are feeling very negative and very angry because they're under the impression that nothing is happening. And there's no way to combat a negative view of our town, either from people outside of our town or residents, <coughs> if they don't have the information that yes, certain attempts are being made even if they didn't come to fruition. I'll tie those two to the last point about the cameras. Um, I understand that it's very difficult. I don't believe we yet have a way to get the message of everything that town council deals with out to the public, okay? Not everybody goes to the town website. Not everybody um, thinks to go on social media or come to a meeting like this and ask a specific question and then have the luxury of an individual like Amy to answer my question. I, should not be, I shouldn't be the exception and one of just a very few people in town who have this information simply because I thought to ask. Everybody needs it. So what I would like to suggest is that we, as a collective, um, town council and anybody from, the, from residents who are um, interested, excuse me, um, to really put our heads together and figure out how do we get messages out to residents before the fact? How do we see to it that the next time something as big as surveillance cameras, and you might get some glimpse into how I feel about it, um, how do we get the message out to people before it's going to be discussed and decided on at one town council meeting to really get people together? How do we get the messages out? Do we put up, do we put information in public spaces? Um, do we make weekly or biweekly announcements in newspapers? What is it that we can do to make sure the information gets out prior to decisions being made? or to share information that most of us are unaware of. So that's my plea for transparency and just letting us know what's going on ahead of time so we have a voice. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Anybody else? Yes. Suzanne Barton, 55 Main Street. Um, I just, a couple quick points to reiterate what some other people have said. I did want to applaud Town Council um, and the Economic Development Commission for putting up a Facebook page and providing some transparency there to give updates on the actual businesses that are coming to town. It was helpful to not, to have some, that actual information and not just 
be on the What's Going On Wethersfield gossip pages. Um, so <laughs> I appreciate it's that. All fact. <laughs> it's all fact, I know. Uh, so I appreciate that communication. Um, I'm also happy to see the vacant building of Tilted Kilt getting filled. Um, and if anyone was doing work getting that filled, then I do appreciate that. I'm going to reiterate what Beth said in that we really need to improve our tax base in town and get these vacant buildings filled. Um, I know there's a little bit of tax revenue coming out of those vacant buildings, but it could be so much more, and we wouldn't be having this debate about cutting vital educational funds if we had that improved tax base. Um, I recently heard of a friend of a friend who was thinking about moving out of town because the high school is not providing for their kids that are somewhat average students with a loss of honors programs. We can't have parents not wanting to raise their kids here because the education system is not funded. So I'm urging you to fully fund the request of the 3.66 increase in the educational budget. This is non-negotiable for our students. We are already lacking lots of resources that other towns have, and this is not the place to find that tax decrease. We need to find it in other places, and we need to improve our tax revenue to get to that. Um, my last thing in regards to the cameras is just another little plug for a fellow citizen. I think we could buy a whole lot of stop signs with that money. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Janice de Roberts, 87 Meadowgate Street. Um, I want to also uh, uh, just offer my support for the education budget. Um, I know as a retired teacher that uh, teachers have learned to make do, but we really, if, if they're telling you they need this money, they need it, and it's really important. The other thing was um, the last meeting, I know that Sally from Physical Services had um, said that th there was possibility of her getting a grant to buy a new um, tr dump truck. And uh, s when she mentioned the ages of the truck, it's to all the trucks, it sounds like they're all pretty elderly. So I would support taking advantage of a grant to replace a truck and then look down the line at exactly how many trucks we're going to need to um, run the town. Um, and also, as far as the cameras go, uh, I really think that this is, uh, for a lot of people, the idea of being surveilled is a very emotional thing, and it's very important to get that word out to people. Um, also, my understanding is that what had originally been approved, as far as the cameras go, is different from how it's actually going to be. Um, so I think that that should be looked at again. Maybe um, it should be looked at to be approved again. Maybe that was because it's changed is my feeling about that. But I also, my, I have liberal and conservative friends who have the same kind of feelings about being watched. And I, so I re just really think that the town uh, needs to know more about it. Thank you. Stop sign. <laughs> Got a primer. Yes, sure, Gus. You know, you, your your call was already up. So, good evening, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the stop sign tonight, but thank you anyway. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk about to say thank you because, you know, last meeting I did complain about the potholes and I tell you, uh, pleasantly surprised that uh, within a couple days uh, that pothole, you know, was filled. So I, I, I think it's pretty good. Uh, what am I going to say tonight? Basically, I was listening to the three gentlemen because I, I don't really know the woman were here, the lady that they were talking. And uh, Fanfara was, has, has been in business for 24 years. Uh, Lesser, I guess, you know, for 17, and uh, Ross Moran for quite a few years, too. These are all Democrats, and I tell you, for the past few years, for the past few years, since I can remember, the taxes in, in Connecticut have been going up each and every year. 
Is it about time that we're really looking at it? What's going on? I mean, all right here, there are a bunch of bulls. That's, that's, what we, that's what we're doing. We're talking and talking and talking, but are we really knowing exactly where they're going? I don't think so. Every time they make a speech, they survey who's listening, and that's what they say. Politics, it's sad. I mean, how can you be one of the worst states in the union for taxes? You know, how, how can you say that basically, you know, we are between Boston, let's say, and New York. We should be flourishing so much, yet everybody wants to leave the state. You have to ask why. You know, it's the mill rate. They say it's on the mill. It's, a, it's on the edge. It's over the edge already for a few years now. Why are they leaving? And you know what it does? I mean, and, and I said this before, that $100,000 in Wethersfield buys much more than in Rocky Hill or Newington. Why? Because of the tax rates. They, they leave. And we're talking about helping this and helping that. And it's, uh, it's all fine and dandy for helping people. But God forbid you miss paying taxes for two or three years and your house will be sold. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. Colantonio. Anybody else willing to speak? Mr. Young. Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. First of all, uh, I have a number of things I wanted, I wanted to talk about, but of course, since we had our Harford delegation here tonight, we had the Weathersfield Historic Society here tonight, and a number of other conversations, I, I feel like I have to address those before I address the things that I want to talk about. So first of all, uh, as far as the Hartford delegation goes, um, I've read where this, our, you know, 53% of our revenue goes into unfunded liabilities. That is a horrendous amount of money to be just being sucked up on deals that were made in the past and nobody cared. Nobody, people liked making deals, but they couldn't back it up. They couldn't support it. And they left it for the next generations to go to take care of it. And here we are in big trouble, thanks to all those great decisions that were made over the years by fantastic people who now have us in a bad position. And they're not there, except for John Fonfara. He's still there. But uh, I, 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 I caught the comment that he made about property tax reform and about we're almost at 40, or we are at 41 mills, which has us on the edge. It has us on, we, it has us on the edge. We talked about this last year as we were approaching that 40 mills. And of course, Mr. Forrest down the other end of the, the dais here says, ah, taxes are only going to go up, what, $7. My taxes went up $590. My taxes went up 7% and we want to spend more money. What, what, what will my taxes go up again? And I only live in a normal house. I don't live in a house over uh, where the, the wealthy people live. But he also said, you know, you know he talked about the, the precious liabilities that we have or the, uh, we're, we're paying for those prior sins. We have a lot of sins in this town that we're now paying for and have been paying for. If we just look at some of the expenditures that we've taken on over the years, especially those expenditures that were done on credit. Credit. Everybody likes to buy on credit because it's easy. Unfortunately, now we're looking at Sally's truck that she wants tonight. And I say, don't give it to her. From what I read, it's the, the freebie truck or the, the truck with the grants is going to cost us $177,000. And where are we going to get the $177,000? Oh, we're going to go and put it, go down to TD Bank, and we're going to get another loan that'll have to be paid along with all those other loans that we have. We're, we're loaded with loans. 
you should ask the town finance director for the list, folks out, in the, out here in the public. It's a long list of, 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 of items that have been bought over the years that we're still making, and, and, and it keeps growing. So I would recommend we not do that. I, um, I'd like to comment on some other issues, but I'm going to get to something that's close to me. Tonight also you're going to be voting on uh, who you're going to have for your next town of attorney. And I understand Jack Bradley wants to be the town attorney again, and then there's some other people as well. Well, we all complain about, I complain about money. But during the Keisha Farm, and, and this young lady sitting out here who spoke about transparency and how she worked with Amy Bellow, who's now what? You might consider her a great person for transparency. Well, let me tell you, you're wrong. During the Keisha Farm issue, did we get to see the appraisal for the farm? Not at all. Those people down there held it up. I sent an FOI to, to the interim town manager asking for the appraisal, and I get this message back. Under, under FOIA, we are not, oh, this is coming from the attorney, Jack Bradley. And this is what he's saying to me as well as the public who wanted to see the appraisal. Under FOIA, we are not required to disclose appraisals until such time as the property has been acquired or transaction has been terminated or abandoned. So here we bought a property. They had, the town paid X amount of dollars for an appraisal, and we never got to see the, impra the appraisal Mr. until Young, after the property is done. We appreciate and, your comments about the appraisal. Um, your five minutes is up. Please. Um, well, thank continue. you very much. I, as, you have, know, as you know, as mayor, these conversations may be we'll going continue. on for a long time. We appreciate it. And you just yep. forced me to you keep coming back. Every... First, uh, second, and third uh, Monday. So, first and third. Sorry, getting my board of ed and council confused. Anybody else willing to speak? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Mary Kay Jensen. I live at 23 Quail Hill, and I just wanted to lend my support to the school budget. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you very much for public comment. Um, just going, uh, I'm going to go a little bit out of order real quick. Um, we are going, I'm going to make a motion to remove item B4G, the clean diesel grant application from the agenda. Give you guys a moment to take a look at that. Is there a reason, Mayor? What's the thinking behind the removal? Um, I just don't think there was an appetite, uh, at least from some of the members that I talked to, uh, about it. Well, actually, I mean, do we discuss and then get a second, or do I make a motion? And uh, motion, second, and then discussion? We can do, I don't think there is discussion on a, is there a discussion on a motion to <laughs> remove? No. In the Robert Pool? There is. Of course, we need a second. Technically, you need a sec I thought we, second. We weren't super formal. Yep. Like, you know, yep. we haven't been hyper technical about the rules of review. I'll so just I'll let you, guys, why, I'll let you guys decide. Why, why are you thinking <laughs> about that? We need this. Uh, that this was going to be removed. Well, I just uh, having had some conversations with some folks about um, uh, the desire for a new truck versus um, the cost that we've already put into. Uh, keeping the current truck online right now. Um, the last meeting that we had, we did have uh, confirmation from the physical services director that the um, that the um, the money was uh, spent to get the truck online, and uh, it is currently online right now. Um, I don't know if we do need a, a new truck at this point, um, but you know, I'll definitely open it up to. There was also some information that we had requested at the last meeting, and we got some of it on Friday, and then some of it, I, 
I think it was emailed earlier today, but I didn't even get it till four o'clock because I didn't because of I didn't check my email. I know you sent it earlier than that, but um, but it's sort of I, there's st so I feel like some of the information I wanted, including the model number, which seems like that would have been pretty easy to get earlier, but so I could do more research into it, and I feel like I haven't had time to to research it because some of the things we asked for two weeks ago just arrived to this afternoon. Do we know what what is the date to apply for this um, grant, if, if that were the pleasure of the council? Do you know the date? What I'm getting at is could we table this to the next meeting so that we could look at the material provided? No, I believe the grant deadline, <coughs> sorry, through you, Mayor. I believe the grant deadline is uh, end of February, and I will double check that now while you're discussing it, but I want to say it was the 28th or 29th of February. 28th, I'm hearing. And, and this is something, you know, it's a request that uh, the physical services um, department has, and I, I believe we can get further discussion, you know, when we are discussing the budget with physical services on a need for, um, a new truck. Councilor Forrest. Sure. Um, we're talking about B4G, is that correct? I believe so. Uh, I have. I just, I didn't remember. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. On, the, the, on the department head comments, it talks about that on the table that this item is to pursue grant funding, but not necessarily pursue the purchase, or am I? Misunderstanding I what read is being requested by the town. I read that as well, but I did see further into it that it was a, that the request was in fact for a replacement. Related to the pursuing of the grant funding. So one sort of like an action, like, okay, you know, we are going to spend this money. One is allowing the town to simply pursue grants. And I'm trying to understand the difference between the two for this particular well, maybe the town manager. Maybe the town manager, but in my reading of it, it was to pursue a grant with the caveat that it would go to a clean diesel um, replacement of a prior, you know, older model diesel engine vehicle. That uh, through you, Mayor. That is correct. The so when you apply for the grant, if the grant is accepted. Um, we would actually have to designate which vehicle we would be replacing. It has to go to one of the larger um, existing diesels. This one, uh, truck nine, actually qualifies for it. So we were technically designating the vehicle. We would have to uh, kind of pre-commit to funding uh, within the budget. But this actual action was just to authorize me to apply for and execute all documentation associated with acceptance of the grant, not the actual purchase. Would it obligate us to then do the purchase? Would it obligate us to then do the purchase? I'm getting, in, we're yeah. getting head shakes up and down left and right, so. Yeah, I mean, yeah. technically you're applying for a grant with the intent of replacing a vehicle. So if you applied for the grant and then turned around and said, yeah, we're not going to replace it. Should we do that? You shouldn't, but you, yeah. I mean, technically we're going to provide an MOU that says within the budget. If come budget time it was so decided that you wouldn't purchase the vehicle, um, you know, you could, but you've now taken, you've now applied for a grant, taken that grant money away from another applicant, which might not necessarily be perceived too well if we go to apply in the future. So there are some dangers to it, saying yes, and then we don't actually go after it. Mr. Jensen? Mr. Deputy Mayor. You might want to recall last year they applied for the same grant, um, unbeknownst to the council. If you remember, Sally came in and said, we received this grant, can we use it on a, another truck? And it was denied at that time for budgetary reasons. And like Gary was saying, that kind of makes the town look bad, like what'd you apply for the grant for if you're not gonna use it? So I think that's the same situation here. Any further discussion? Motion has been made and seconded uh, to remove uh, item B4G. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion adopted.
Uh, second uh, motion would be to move now item B2A, which is the land lease uh, RFP, from the table back to the uh, to the agenda. I need a second on that. Second. Oh, thank you. A motion made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying. Well, I think I'll make. Yeah, let me just move it back to the uh, um, agenda. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Now, uh, now the motion to move but, uh, item B2A, the land lease uh, RFP, uh, from um, that position to item now, I'll move it to where the clean diesel was, item B, now move it to item B4G. Can you do that one again, Mike? <laughs> yeah. Uh, motion, <laughs> we had I'll, to. I'll admit if, if anything yeah, else, like I've, we, I've got it. <laughs> we had to remove it from unfinished Thanks. business. Now I need to move it to a new place on the agenda. B4, uh, what are you moving now? I, I'm moving it from B2A, which we removed it off of unfinished business. Yep. Now I need to move it to a place on the agenda. Right. So we might as well put it where the clean diesel was as an open space right Doesn't now. Doesn't it put it other business? You can move it anywhere you want. Yeah, I guess it could be in other business. We were okay. kind of deciding whether or not an RFP would be a bid or other business. So it, it's a real tricky spot because I think the intent was to move it towards the end so that my staff who are here tonight, um, as well as if any representatives um, for the attorney conversation don't have to sit during any debate or dialogue related to this item. Do you want to move it to B4G now? Is that the idea? Yes, right. to the open spot. Uh, I think a motion was made and seconded. Second. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Thank you and thank you for bearing with us on that <laughs> sure. move right there. Um, and actually we're still going in. Uh, council reports. Uh, open it up the floor for council reports. Councilor Flanagan. Uh, Youth Advisory Board met on February 6th. It is um, mostly continued business. The after school programs are running strong since school got back from winter break. Uh, three dates to keep in mind. April 7th is their volunteer recognition event um, where they recognize uh, students who are going above and beyond in their community service. I think someone had said that a student has already done a couple hundred hours this school year in community service. Um, April 23rd and May 12th will also be um, their big events as far as recognizing uh, students and fundraising for their recognition at the end of the year, they get a scholarship. Um, the council that we could actually approved for the meeting, a new federal grant that's available. Um, I, to my understanding, it's actually more money than the previous grant they were going for. It's up to $300,000 for up to five years. Um, that is due March 7th, so they are hard at work in their assigned groups to try and get everything done and in time, and um, they're doing a uh, great job, but that's mostly what's going on there. Great. I appreciate it. Anybody else? <coughs> Parker. I attended the Veterans Commission on the 12th. They had a good turnout. They closed to wrap up their survey. They had over 200 responses, which was great considering they didn't really mail anything. So it was either online, in paper, in the library, over the phone. Um, they had a couple younger veterans that were attending for the first time, and they got several responses about people who are interested in helping on that commission. There's a full-time vacancy and two alternate vacancies. So they had a retreat on Saturday. I wasn't able to attend due to my son's hockey game, um, but I believe actually Ken Lesser uh, attended, he was the former liaison, and they were gonna talk more about the survey and have a little bit of a pathway forward and, and talk about some of their goals and objectives. So that was a good group. And then on the 13th, I attended EDIC and the RDA in a joint meeting, trying to streamline the back-to-back -back of two similar meetings, but with some differences. Um, Gary was in attendance. There was discussion about redevelopment opportunities at 1000 Silas Dean Highway, which is the former Weight Watchers building. Um, those discussions continue in several facets. There was a presentation by former Mayor Montaneri about some of his efforts with the property owner. 
Um, the EDIC and RDA are definitely interested in seeing that parcel redeveloped under the right circumstances and at a you know, highest and best use. So there was some discussion about continuing the storage uh, facility moratorium and that was recommended to move forward to planning and zoning for another six months. Um, there's some interest in maybe that use at 1000 Silas Dean, so that is an ongoing discussion and something we're looking at, but it was a very good meeting. Um, those of you interested in business development, if you can attend on a second Thursday at noon, lunch is provided, welcome your input. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. I uh, attended a planning and zoning meeting on the 4th. Um, two approvals were granted. One was the uh, uh, 1210 Silestine Highway, uh, former Puritan furniture facility for two, uh, two medical office buildings and a employee uh, daycare center, total of 80,000 square feet. There had been some concerns or issues with traffic and parking, the size of the parking lot um, holds uh, 610 vehicles, which is in excess of what the town requirements and guidelines are. So there was some concerns about that. Um, they were resolved to the town's satisfaction. There's gonna be entrance and exit <coughs> off of Mill Street and South Scene Highway. So that's gonna help split the traffic up uh, the impact. Uh, the second item that was approved was uh, Clarity Ed Test Prep. It's a school that provides classes for uh, SATs, ACTs, and AP exams, and that's going in at uh, 1323 Southstein Highway, which is the former uh, Tritown YMCA space, and uh, that was approved also. That's it. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, it, it, were the Mill Street, um, the people that live on Mill Street notified about the traffic flow onto Mill Street because I know the condos there yep. have had a lot of concerns about traffic flow in the past. Yeah, there was, uh, this was a follow-up meeting that had been uh, tabled. Uh, there was pretty good uh, uh, attendance by uh, Middletown Avenue and Mill Street uh, residents. The developer, uh, I thought, did a fantastic job of reaching out to the neighbors. He walked the street. He, knocked on doors and tried to get everybody's feedback uh, b before the meeting. So uh, they did have concerns. The concerns were addressed. They, they had a traffic engineer, to be quite honest, I've never seen a traffic engineer show up there that says it's going to create traffic, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, but uh, I, I thought it was a, a good plan and was well, well explained to the public, and I think it's going to be a real asset to the town. I'm glad to hear that traffic concerns have been addressed because I know the people on Mill Street have had a really rough couple of years with everything that's gone on there. So to add another project that's of concern to them, I'm glad it's being and, uh, handled properly. Even more so on Middletown Avenue because of course, yeah. that's going to be the main cut through for the board and um, to get onto Route Three. Yeah, to so it already is uh, yeah. fast, but <coughs> there's been a couple. Uh, incidents where there was a traffic situation on 91 and that was like a parking lot there on Middletown Avenue so thank you Tom what's the uh, amount of the investment in that project ballpark I I'm gonna say it was 10 or 12 million dollars I think don't don't quote me on that okay. it was a substantial investment and um, just to further that, you know, the medical uh, office type buildings ha tend to have a uh, very high uh, personal property uh, valuation with all, you know, CAT scan machines and things of that nature. So it's uh, per square foot, it's a real uh, benefit to the town tax base. Great. Thank you, Tom. Councilor Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. Um, met with Deb Cohen the other day as it relates to the Human Rights Committee. Human Rights Committee had not met very often in the last few years, but recently they've really seen, I think, a really positive, or I know a really positive influx of uh, interest. And they've come up with a, or they're developing right now to finalize their mission statement. But in addition to that, if we just sort of globally think about human interaction in our society, 
the idea that the ideas that are coming forth from the Human Rights Committee is one of inclusion, is one of understanding our neighbors who may be different than we are, not we as like here, but like you know, than personal we, by understanding uh, inclusion and having uh, events that bring neighbors together. Um, and this is the mentality I think that the committee is bringing and they're coming up with events that they think will be successful in understanding different pockets of our town that may be a little bit more insular than the ones that have been here for generation after generation after generation and how to make everyone feel comfortable and having a welcoming town. So it's all very positive. We had a great conversation with Deb Cohen and she continues to lead this group in order to have a good inclusion and to make sure that everyone feels welcome. So you'll be hearing more as the time goes on about those type of events that the, the committee will be sponsoring and working on and hope that we can all find it be able to support them in that work. Great, we appreciate that. Councilor Pelletier. Um, I attended the Housing Authority meeting on February 10th. Um, so the Housing Authority had applied for, a, last year applied for a Community Development Block Grant, or CTDBG, to renovate one of its elderly and disabled housing apartment buildings. It, last year its application was not selected for the grant and the Housing Authority director indicated she's been in, in touch with the town manager re, uh, regarding the status of the program and the possibility of resubmitting last year's CDBG application this spring um, because the town has to apply for the CDBG funds on behalf of the Housing Authority as the Housing Authority cannot apply for the grant directly. Also, the Housing Authority board and director are interested in having an informational meeting with the town council sometime after budget season, so um, to acquaint the town council members with the housing authority's work. So that's something that is down the line they're interested in doing. So maybe Gary, you could talk to the, uh, Kate about mm -hmm. that. That'd be a great idea, have them come in and you know, give a presentation, inform us, some of us, you know, even those who have been on the council uh, for a number of years don't know exactly what goes on with our uh, housing authority I know they do a great job but uh, you know any clarification of some of the um, concerns that we are at least getting emailed about um, would be great I do appreciate that um, and without further ado uh, just one real quick uh, I see uh, mr. clinch and mr. Newell here I did attend the Memorial Day parade committee just last week it was after the uh, veterans uh, committee uh, meeting the, uh, the parade steps off at nine o'clock on Saturday, May 23rd. I know it's a little far out there, but at least it gives us something to look forward to in the next couple months. Um, this year's uh, theme for the 100th uh, anniversary, and I know Mr. Clinch is a member of it, uh, the Disabled American Veterans uh, Group, they're celebrating their 100th anniversary, and that is the theme of this year's uh, Memorial Day Parade. I know there will be more opportunities to talk about it, but uh, now that the, the theme has been finalized, I just wanted to put a, a bug in everybody's ear that that is going on May 23rd, 9 o'clock in the morning. Thank you. <coughs> and then just regular council comments from anybody. Um, thank you, Mayor. Kim Bobbin and WEC, they are looking for community messengers. Those are people in our community who are able to attend um, a series of training events, and these community messengers will then um, have conversations with their friends and neighbors in order to um, bring people together and disperse information. It's another way to get um, information out to, to the public. Um, things like United Way, the Wethersfield Public School System, our library, um, all the different um, programs that we have to offer. Uh, this information can get to people who might not be tapped into the system. So um, they are looking for people. If you're interested, you can contact Kim Bobbin um, through the Social and Youth Services Department, I believe. Um, the food bank is in need of items. There's a list online. Uh, briefly, it's pasta, rice, canned chicken, tuna, peanut butter, cereal, and personal hygiene products. Uh, people are good at having collections, like we've said, at the holidays, but the need exists all year round. So if you are interested or able to bring um, <coughs> goods to the food bank, Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30 in the lower level of this building. Um, if you want to follow up on any state issues, our representative, Carrie Wood, is having a coffee on 220, that's Thursday at 830 at Heirloom Market. 
Um, if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her or just get some more information from her, she will be there then. Um, I did have down the YAB fundraiser at Wooden Tap is uh, April 23rd at 6.30, and that's a fundraiser for their scholarship program, which does help uh, get a student in Weathersfield. And then as Amy, the um, director of the Historical Society, mentioned, April 4th is the Taste of Weathersfield. Also, April 4th is the Weathersfield High Safe Grat um, dinner, uh, not dinner, dance fundraiser. So we've got two events going on in town that are both worthwhile on April 4th. So that's all I have for my reports. Great. Thank you, Councillor Bello. Councillor Hill. Uh, yeah, I was just, uh, regarding some of the comments we had here tonight, uh, is there any way we could perhaps ask the chief to come in and talk to, especially the new members, about the video cameras, the installation, and kind of the history behind it, just so we can kind of start having that conversation? I'd mentioned, you know, just as the conversation yeah. from the public comment, I, I did mention something to a, a town manager about that. Um, it was done, and I think, you know, just the three of us, you know, Councilor Bell, of course, and myself were members of that. So uh, it was about a year ago. So yeah. So I, if, I if like we, the idea. If, yeah, yeah. If, we could make, if we could make that request uh, to him. And also, uh, also piggybacking on some of the comments, too, I mean, it kind of was, I shouldn't say surprising, but we had several people come in and talk about transparency, openness in government, and we just voted to remove um, an item on the agenda that would have spent $200,000 worth of the town's money, and we didn't really have a debate why. Um, I think we all know why. There's probably not enough support here to vote it, but we could just leave it on the agenda. If there's not support, it could simply be voted down. At least then residents know where we're all coming from, um, and you know, even the department knows where each member is coming from. I just... You know, you hear about, we want to talk about transparency. I think that's, you know, that way we can, uh, each of our views can be reflected by all residents in the town. And I think it will be, you know, there will be further discussions on purchases. You know, the budget, you know, the town manager will propose his budget after we have dialogue with department heads. So there is an opportunity at that point for us to hear and we would, sh you know, share any insight to, uh, to the public as well. Uh, we did this, uh, I think we tabled the uh, physical services lift last year after some conversations, and I, th I wanna say it was probably tabled for <coughs> two or three, at least two or three months. Um, a year and a half. Oh, year and a half, sorry. Uh, a year and a half, so I mean, precedent has been set to, to table something, and you know, it's, uh, it's on the uh, agenda for a, a long while. I think at this point we were just, you know, making the decision to pull it off for right now to have further conversation when, in fact, the budget is presented in front of us. Okay, but point well taken, Councilor Hill. Uh, <coughs> just a Council couple quick things. Um, there's an article in the Hartford Business Journal that an independent uh, high-speed internet service provider, provider Go NetSpeed, is investing in Weathersfield. They're building a fiber optic network it's coming, rolling out this year. It's supposed to be a flat $50. Um, I think it's great to have options with respect to that. If you read the Facebook groups, there's a lot of banter about which one is worse, Cox <laughs> or Frontier. So this is out there. I know I've read about it. It's been in the west end of Hartford and West Hartford for a couple years. Maybe mixed reviews, but nonetheless, it's another choice. So if you're interested, you can just go to gonetspeed.com and read about it. And if you're interested, they just plug your name and address or whatever. I think it's it's coming. You don't have to go to like make the case. They've decided to invest in the community, but it's great for business development to have another option. Um, so I look forward to seeing how that rolls out. And then real quick, just some comments about ways to be engaged. For anyone watching on TV or in the audience, the town manager has a weekly email or a weekly uh, newsletter that comes out that I think gets emailed out from time to time. There's a town email list that you can sign up for if you haven't. And then specific to business, Chamber of Commerce actually has a pretty good listserv. So if you're interested in business development, they've had a couple ribbon cuttings. I think Mike may have attended uh, their little antique store next to uh, Aroma Bistro recently. And there's another one upcoming for a physical therapy office. So that's of interest. Those are some tools where you can sign up and then it comes to you. You don't have to go digging for it um, and checking websites all the time. But I think your point is well taken. I suggested to the manager, maybe even with a new 
town website, a uh, subscription tool so you could link a calendar in on your phone and then maybe links to the agendas and such. So what we can do to make it easier to get the info, we will. We're definitely pushing that. Anybody else? Council Thomas? Mayor, can I just um, follow up briefly on the, um, the cameras that were being installed? I'd love to have the police chief here, but um, we won't be meeting again for two weeks. Maybe in the meantime, um, the town manager could make a you know, some kind of a brief statement in, you know, in writing um, I, to let people know. I think there is a lot of miscommunication. Um, the, those cameras are passive. They aren't going to ticket you because you're speeding or you have your phone in your hand or you forgot to put your seatbelt on. Um, it's, the purpose of it is it's a tool to use um, if there's, you know, um, a, a kidnapping or a um, crime that's committed somewhere. It's a, it's a way to um, go into a system and try to track um, a vehicle from one community to another. Um, it's, it's not active, it's not looking for speeders, it's not looking for people going through red lights. So we do, we do need to let people know that kind of information um, in, and that may alleviate some of the fears people have about Big Brother watching them and thinking that you know, you go five miles over the speed limit on the Berlin Turnpike, you're gonna, your license will get banged and you'll get a ticket in the mail. That was not the purpose of these cameras. Um, and you know, again, having the chief here is wonderful, but if we could maybe have some kind of a statement go live on our website or Facebook just to alleviate some of those fears and just give some you know, general information about why we approve them, the purpose of them for us. And they're not, they're not necessarily integrated with uh, other communities, but there's a database and the towns all pull from that database is my understanding, but I'm not an expert on it at all. I actually told someone in the audience that technology is totally not my thing. So um, if we could have some you know, solid information just put out there, that would help all of us in the meantime before the chief can get into us. That's a great idea, and, and just following up on that, if I'm not mistaken, a number of years ago, the police department did a uh, PSA to residents that have either the Nest or the Ring system on their uh, doorbells so that they can take an inventory of those that do have it. So if there's a crime, say, on you know, Dix or uh, um, Dale Street or something, that they can follow, find out who has posted that they have those cameras on their front doorstep so if there is a car that they're looking for or an abduction of a child or something in the neighborhood that they can go to that resource of um, folks who have those cameras and you know ask them you know did you it was it on this day this time can we look at your camera to find out whether or not a certain vehicle make model had been by it so it is out there right now I mean it, it, the fear of Big Brother I think is in everybody's mind but uh, it, the passive uh, way of doing this is, uh, um, you know, it, I think it does need to be explained to the public. And, and if we can do that, uh, Mr. Town Manager, that would be appreciative. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. I, you know, Brooks Parker, uh, Councilor Parker, Brooks, whatever, <laughs> I brought up so a very important aspect of having fiber optics be part of the backbone of our technology grid. And it will, it will and should uh, provide a lot of prosperity and enjoyment for all the regular users if you're more of a residential. But even from a commercial base, extremely important thing to bring up. And thank you, Brooks, for bringing that up. As it relates, though, we have had uh, new entries into the market, which probably, I think, use the uh, utility lines. And sometimes that comes with clutter and where they can come in and destroy – destroy but put large boxes in certain areas so I'm wondering through you mayor to the town manager can we get updated as this starts to roll out what is the impact going to be for the town from a public utility standpoint um, are, are there and I don't know the in infrastructure of fiber optics very well but are we going to find another set of boxes on corners like we sometimes see with frontier hanging on lines on poles um, what does that infrastructure look like as it now multiplies on top of the rest of the infrastructure? Are, are there, if they are going to do that, are there any offsetting costs that the town can maybe see from this new rollout? 
uh, which may be interesting. Are there fiber optic capabilities now that are offered to governments as part of this rollout? Um, there may be a lot of opportunity here from both I'm the towns. I'm seeing uh, our IT folks not in their heads in the yeah. audience. So. <laughs> um, there may be a lot of rollout from a town standpoint, but also just from a residential standpoint. Um, these boxes could certainly be put in areas where it might cause traf traffic hazard. I'm not saying there's no fear mongering here, you know, the rest of it. It's going to be, I really like the idea of fiber optics, but there could be a lot of discussion with Pure if, if the rollout is done one way or if it's done another way. And if we could be in, have an understanding about how that rollout is going to be, and we don't play a passive, we play a more aggressive, not in a bad way, but just in a monitoring way, mm -hmm. um, having our, our thoughts uh, put forth as the rollout comes out of Wethersfield, I think that would be helpful. That's a great idea. Duly noted. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, just real quick. Um, unfortunately, uh, Mrs. Rue, Barbara Rue, is not in attendance. She was here, but she had to take uh, her grandson. She just texted me that she wasn't going to be able to stay. Uh, uh, Rep, um, Barbara Rue, as well as Cindy Greenblatt, two residents in the town of Wethersfield, had both approached me uh, at the end of last year and in the beginning of this year. Uh, this also marks the 100th anniversary of the women's suffrage movement in, state, in the, the, the nation. Uh, the state of Connecticut is rolling out a number of initiatives uh, for each town to, uh, to take part in and celebrate those milestones. I would be remiss if I did not you know, partake in those uh, at all, having you know, been the son of a, the second female governor of the state of Connecticut, first female Republican governor of the state of Connecticut. So um, I have been, had ingrained in my uh, head the importance of voting not only for those uh, um, you know, folks, but those who you know, come to America for the first time and the, the proud privilege that they have to be able to vote for the first time. So um, with that said, uh, I did task both uh, commissioner, or commissioners, uh, Councilors Bellow and Pelletier to um, serve as co-chairs of that, and they both graciously accepted um, the town's uh, um, centennial celebration of the women's suffrage movement. Um, if there are any folks in the audience or watching TV that you know might have some ideas or some interest in in partaking in that uh, endeavor, please uh, you know reach out to either the town manager and you can get the information to um, both Amy, Amy and Mar uh, Mary, uh, and we can go forward with that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is also uh, last. It, was, it just so happened that after the last meeting we had uh, the following day um, some debris um, of concern washed up on the shore of uh, uh, the cove. Unfortunately, it, it posted, uh, posed a uh, health issue and a safety issue. Hypodermic needles had washed up on the um, shore of the, the cove. Looking into it a little bit further, we had asked if any reports had come in. Unfortunately, no reports had come in, but it was determined that they uh, actually were found in the garbage cans. People, they were properly disposed of. Uh, but unfortunately, due to a heavy rain and uh, flooding in the, uh, the cove, the garbage cans that were close to the water had actually overflowed, and then any debris that was in there had actually washed out. Um, I checked with MDC as well as a number of other folks, and they said no, it wouldn't come downstream from uh, any MDC plants. So it was, uh, in fact, from garbage cans that had been flooded out. I did ask the town manager if we can just make sure that for the time being until the final flood, you know, spring thaw uh, north of us recedes that we can uh, move those garbage cans up to a, a safer location so that, uh, you know, something like this doesn't happen again. Um, it was briefly mentioned by uh, Councillor Parker about the uh, new uh, business in uh, Old Weathersfield Circa is the name of it. And uh, town manager, deputy mayor, and myself were there for a ribbon cutting last week. It's an antique shop right in, you know, you're correct, right in the same plaza as uh, Village Pizza. Uh, we wish them all the best. Uh, it's great to have businesses coming to town and opening. Um, you know, it's kind of uh, ironic that a, an antique store comes into uh, Old Weathersfield, but uh, it is great to have them. Uh, wish them the best of luck. And finally, I uh, took the honor uh, of being a uh, presenter of an award for uh, former Deputy Mayor, former Councilor Mike Hurley, who is serving as the uh, Grand Marshal of the 2020 St. Patrick's Day Parade this year. Uh, Weathersfield is fortunate enough to have a number of members uh, with such accolades as um, uh, friend of the parade, former uh, st State Senator Paul Doyle is uh, honored with that, friend of the parade, and then Weathersfield's own Morgan, 
uh, Grabowski is Scholar of the Year uh, for the parade. So uh, we're fortunate enough to have uh, at least three members leading off the parade. It does not mean this contingent, Weathersfield contingent, gets to go first. We still have to wait. I think we're ninth <laughs> in the list. But um, I do look forward to marching in that. That, I believe, is on the 14th of March this year in Hartford. And uh, we'd love to have folks from Weathersfield join us. Uh, you know, the council and Board of Ed are both invited to, to partake. And I think having uh, former Deputy Mayor Mike Hurley being the Grand, Grand Marshal, having a show of support behind him uh, with Weathersfield would be a great idea. That's all I got for council comments. Thank you. Moving into action. Uh, I don't believe we have any appointments. Oh, sorry, I always forget poor Dolores. Town Clerk Communications. Uh, yeah. Oh, and <laughs> most important, <laughs> my left hand man. Town manager goes. You got to point to the correct one. Sorry. I can't I gotta, get the word I got to go, go off of the agenda. I can't just. Mike, there's yeah. a list here. Yeah, I got to go off the agenda. I can't just fly through it. I know. It's 9 o'clock already, though. So. I don't know if I can be brief. That's not something I'm good at. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll try to do this as quickly as possible. Um, just a quick update. Transparency. Uh, the Keisha Farms Committee has been uh, meeting. Those meetings have been fairly well attended by uh, individuals uh, who are interested in more information. I wanted to let the group know that there were 10 responses to the request for proposals. Uh, out of those 10, we've narrowed down to four. Um, there will be a subcommittee that will review those uh, in the following weeks, and we will narrow it down to our recommendation. Back to the full committee, and then the... Um, uh, you know, from there we have to figure out where the funding lies. But um, our intent is by the first meeting in Mar the only meeting in March, March 6th, the first Monday, uh, we'll actually have um, a consultant to be named um, to kind of lead us into the charge. And that's actually a reminder that the consultant's role will be to help to determine possible reuse scenarios of the 30 plus acres based on input from residents, elected officials, businesses, uh, the community as a whole. It's not um, just specific to the, um, to the ad hoc committee. It's, it's really about having the consultant bring the community through a visioning process as to what can go there. Um, so I will make sure to not only inform the council, but inform as many residents through as many medias as possible, uh, medium as possible as to when those dates will be um, so that we can have the best possible attendance. Uh, began budget meetings with department heads uh, a draft of the capital improvement plan, which was a recommendation by the Capital Improvement Advisory Committee, is going forward to the Planning and Zoning Commission in the month of March for their review. Per charter, the budget will be uh, available for view by the first Monday in April, which I think is April 6th, if I remember correctly. Uh, we remain on track. I see actually my the town's director of finance in the audience, and I want to thank him for his due diligence and pressing the department heads to get the information as quickly as they can uh, so that we can begin the review and keeping me on track. Uh, just for information, we de did rebid the High Crest Portables. If you recall from last year, the bid went out relatively late in the season and we believe that's the majority of the reason why we only received one bid and that bid was extremely high um, based off of what we estimated that it could be. So it has been rebid. We are almost three months ahead of where we were last year with bidding it out. So we're hoping that we'll get um, some lower responses to that. And for those of you hearing this out there in the audience, if you're interested in bidding, they are due March 6th. <clears throat> Sorry, March 6th. So if you go to our website under bids, you'd be able to download the most recent application information and respond. Uh, a couple quick comments regarding um, Councilor Pelletier's uh, uh, mentioning of the housing authority that is the request for proposals went out to hire a consultant to help in drafting the grant proposal um, and doing an analysis so that we can make sure that we're a little bit more successful in the 2019 application to the state that is community development block grant um, the state is uh, we receive the money through uh, there's two there's a double process the first is an entitlement process there are 21 entitlement communities within the state, and then the state of Connecticut itself is considered an entitlement community. They get a large 
allocation. The number hasn't come out for this year, but it's usually 20 plus million. Um, that dollar amount will then come down to communities like Weathersfield in what's called the small cities application. So we're hoping we've been successful in the past. We're hoping we'll continue to be successful in the future. Hopefully um, we just didn't score enough points last year because the com competition was so fierce. Uh, on the transparency conversation with the website, I think uh, the mayor had mentioned it, a number of, count, uh, I know Councillor Parker mentioned it, um, but we are working with staff internally to see what options there are to expand the existing website at a lower cost versus going out and redoing the entire website. I think there's some good information in there currently, so I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, uh, but there, are, there might be some opportunities to expand our ability to reach a deeper audience or at least be able to increase communication or ensure that people are getting the information that they need. So we continue to work on that in the um, most frugal manner possible. Uh, the mayor had already mentioned the ribbon cutting, um, which I thought was a great turnout. And I do love the irony of having a, uh, an antique store in Old Weathersfield. Maybe we could put a couple more in there for a competition. Uh, I think from an economic development standpoint, um, that happens to be a very large focus of mine. And um, the employees, or sorry, staff as a whole are working on a strategic plan for multiple levels. There are many opportunities within, um, within the community for us to grow the tax base. One of our biggest problems are that um, because of the existing stock, uh, commercial stock here, we tend to recycle what already exists. That does not grow or expand the tax base. That just continues the existing tax base. So when you have a budget that continues to increase because costs go up um, and your tax, um, your tax base stays the same, you have a, a further gap. So internally, we're working through uh, a number of different venues to try to squeeze that gap a little bit and creative with the existing property that we have. Um, so I thank you for pointing that out. Um, it is not something that goes unnoticed. Um, the question is, how do we repurpose the tax base so that we can stabilize the tax base? So, um, and that includes looking at possible incentives. Um, and to that note, again, on transparency, I'm happy to produce um, the uh, planning department creates a list of current activities that are going on from a development standpoint. Um, some things we can share. Others we can't. If anything is at the beginning stages, we try not to scare off developers too soon in the process. So I will make that report uh, more accessible to the council and the general public by posting it on the website. And I think in the interest of time, I'll keep that. Uh, that'll be it. Great. Thank you. Dolores? Okay. So we're going to have a presidential preference primary April 28th. 2019, all polling places are open, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. We are going to have a Democratic and Republican uh, primary. That's it. And the uh, deadline has passed, if I'm not mistaken, to switch parties to vote yes. in that? Yep. If you're unaffiliated, you can join a party, but otherwise it's too late. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay. Without further ado. Um, we moved finished unfinished business uh, council action B 3a appointment of a town attorney if I'm not mistaken we don't have any boards uh, appointments or resignations nope. nothing in the last minute no. nope okay thank you <coughs> start it I can I can Sure, I can jump in. Um, the uh, subcommittee of the council uh, met to review or to interview uh, two respondents and, um, and a decision was made and a, a debate happened and then I'll hand it over to, uh, would it be the chairperson of the subcommittee? I don't know how that worked. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I would open it up to the discussion of all three, but um, I think uh, Councillor Peltier has some information Oh, yes, yeah, so um, we had met with the two of the finalists, and um, we are recommending the majority of the subcommittee, I guess, is recommending um, Halloran Sage be appointed as the town attorney. Um, uh, a court, should, you we know, a, should we make a motion first and second to uh, then discuss? 
of it matters. Yeah, I don't know if it does. Um, technically, you should, but yeah. it's probably not. Okay, well, but stuff. you know, you can do it if there's no objection. No one's objecting, so it's fine. <laughs> right. Without objection. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> Oh, should I make the motion then? No. Okay. We can yeah, so uh, according to the town charter, there's uh, the town attorney's appointed for a two-year term, and so this is a process that we should go through every two years. And um, Halloran & Sage is one of Connecticut's leading law firms in representing <coughs> municipalities and government agencies in the state. <coughs> it was founded in 1935, has over 100 attorneys and six offices throughout the state of Connecticut. The firm is currently serving as town attorney for 23 Connecticut towns and serves as special counsel or land use counsel for more than 60 other towns in the state. Um, Halloran, Halloran Sage has served as Weathershield's town attorney in the past and is still currently represents the town in several special matters. So I recommend, I, and you know, we met with them and I was impressed and I think um, that uh, they would do a great job. Um, I was also. Yeah, you were on yeah, the Thank you. I was also a member of the committee. There were five firms that um, submitted proposals for the town of Weathersfield. We did narrow it down to two Halloran and Sage and Roe McGuigan. I agree, Halloran and Sage has good municipal experience and a deep bench, um, but Roe McGuigan does as well. Um, when I look at the prices, they're comparable. Um, and I think that um, Roe McGuigan has served us well in the past. I did mention in the subcommittee meeting that I had two concerns with possible conflicts of interest with Halloran and Sage, um, one being that one of the partners represents Mira, and we've talked about Mira at the last, I believe, three town council meetings, um, and how you know we have questions about their feasibility and moving forward with them and what different options look like. So I was concerned that one of the partners does represent Mira and um, if, they're represent if the firm is representing us too and we do end up having some kind of difficulty or any kind of litigation or even um, like mediation, there'd be a conflict there and we'd have to um, probably have a different counsel for that. Um, and then the other thing is one of the partners does serve on our planning and zoning commission and there may never be a conflict of interest, but that too could have a possible conflict of interest down the road. Um, my other um, concern is that I think the numbers are different um, in the, the RFP paper that we got in committee versus what's presented to us in our packet. So that's my other concern with the, um, unless I'm reading it wrong, that it has different um, fee proposals. For the associates, I, I did notice that too. I think there was, it was just slightly off, not, but I did bring the original documents. Yeah, do, I have them here too. So those are my comments on it. I could just I just say a couple words about the the conflicts of interest. Um, y these things do come up from time to time, and if if there is a conflict between the town and Mira, um, we would of course have to use another law firm that's currently done. If there's a conflict, um, and we could continue to use Roe McGuigan, in a, if we do have some conflict with Mira. Um, as for the member of the Planning and Zoning Commission that's on the um, th who's also a partner at Haller and Sage, I think that, um, you know, there wouldn't be a conflict between the town of Wethersfield and the town's planning and zoning commission. I mean, if something like that were to come up, I think that it, in any event, regardless of if one of the, uh, you know, who's on planning and zoning, they would have to be two separate firms representing the entities. But I think if the town and planning and zoning are you know, going to litigation, the town has a lot bigger problems than who the town attorney is. <laughs> um, I, th I don't think that has happened, and I, do, I think it's a theoretical possibility, but in reality, I don't think that there's any realistic chance of that happening. And I guess I have a question for the town manager. Do we hire outside counsel on a routine, or you know, when conflicts do arise, or for 
special circumstances? Uh, well, the quick answer is for special circumstances, we do. I don't know for the town if we've ever had conflict of interest where we had to. I can't say for other communities that has happened um, th that I've worked for. Um, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be odd to hire outside counsel um, to cover. Um, you know, sometimes if a need arises, and even with a deep bench, sometimes there's a specialist that's outside. Um, from a planning and zoning standpoint, for example, there are people who are um, might have more expertise um, in planning or tried and true in, in federal courts on a, on a planning issue. So you, it wouldn't be uncommon to go outside. Okay. Thank you. I think you should tell us who the town, the, who we is going to be the lead attorney from Halloran Estates. It's not just a member of the uh, team and three. No. No, 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 no correct. No. Ken, uh, the, Ken, 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 Ken Slater is going to be the lead. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point, Dolores. Um, and then I had a question about current ongoing litigation that Roe McGuigan is currently involved in. Would they stay as our turn turn a town attorney for those matters that they are currently representing the town on? Yes, previous practice has been, and I strongly encourage it, would be that if the current attorney is already working on something and they continue to work on it, you uh, it's, there's dangers to switching attorneys midway through any kind of um, okay. work. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? No, I was actually just the, the third to serve on the committee and you know I kind of agree with what Mary was saying is that uh, I just I thought both both candidates were, were obviously highly qualified. I think I think um, Mr. Bradley has done a great job for us but when it came down to it I thought Haller and Sage um, and what Ken Slater provided us just with the deeper bench and, and just some of the specifics in, in terms of, oh, I think that what we're aiming for as a town, I thought they, they provided better solutions at this time. Okay, appreciate it. Any other questions or comments? Councilor Forrest? Thanks, Mayor. Could you, I was not in the committee, so this is sort of the first time that I'm getting a good feel, and I respect the committee's work uh, for the whittle down because there are two class actions here. I mean, at the end of the day, um, can you give a little bit more ex uh, detail about uh, maybe uh, Pat about what kind of solutions that were provided? What impressed you about Halloran and, and this particular recommendation? Yeah, you know, I, I can't recall the actual um, specific answer, but uh, the, the, I remember the question that I asked, and it basically came down to something that was specifically in their packet and. Uh, my, my question was was a response to it, and that was, um, you know, we're not just a cut and paste law firm. We don't just copy other municipalities and and basically apply it to your municipality. We come up with tailor fit solutions, um, and I really liked what they had to say in terms of what their thought process was and how they actually whittled down specific solutions to specific municipalities. Um, and on the rates, uh, is I was going from the information that was provided in the packet, again, but was the committee provided different information about what the actual rates of the lawyers are? I just, uh, so I was just looking that up just now. Um, yeah, I think it was just, this is slightly off, so I will just read this. So with Haller and Sage, the information there is actually correct. So partners, 175 an hour, associates, 155 an hour. Paralegals, 95 an hour. For Rome McGuigan, partners also 175 an hour. Associates, 145 an hour. And paralegals, 115 an hour. So they're slightly less with the associates and a bit more with the paralegals. So it all, it's pretty much, the cost is com very comparable. Um, what is the, have, did you discuss, were you able to discuss with both firms about what their conflict resolution <coughs> would be? If you run into a, whether it's a P&Z issue, or just any conflict, right? Because I mean, conflicts occur in all kinds of things. These large firms represent so many people that it happens, you recognize it, you move on. But what is our conflict resolution, or what is their proposed conflict resolution when one happens? Well, it is a large firm, so like you said, like these things come up all the time sure. in large firms. So um, I, they did mention, you know, if it comes up that they, you, we can either just continue to use Roe McGuigan 
or they might have another firm that they would refer us to if it's something specific maybe that, you know, but but it's it seemed like it wasn't gonna be like a, you know, much of an issue. Is that the, do they have like a, do, is there a backup firm that we use as a town that says, okay, when there's a conflict with A, we move to B? Is it is it Rome? Is it, would it be the other way around? You know, if if a Rome were chosen, would it be Halloran? How 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 do we normally do that? What is our process? I mean, we would we would search for outside counsel. I can't say uh, since I'm not yet at my one year anniversary. I can't say previously how we've done it, but uh, typically you would you would just acquire outside counsel. In this case, it, it would probably make sense to go with a Rome simply because they are familiar with us. We've worked with them for many years and. Um, have a history with them. Um, so I, you know, and obviously I, I don't think you'd go through an RFP process at that point. You would assign separate counsel. Have we, uh, thank you for that, by the way. Um, have we gone back to Halloran and, com and conversely, have we gone back to Rome and said, hey, are you able to beat, if we were at Halloran, have you been able, can you match you know, Rome's 145 or beat 145 an hour associate rate and and correspondingly to Rome, Halloran's coming in at much less at, you know, well, significantly less, or however you want to define that adjective, nine, uh, less <coughs> on the paralegal rate. Rome, can you can you come in less than 95? Have we been able to talk to them to see if we can get their, their rates lowered or if they agree to a lowering? Mr. Town Manager? Yeah, I can. Um, no, uh, frankly, haven't uh, had that discussion with them. Um, <clears throat> I try not to play bidders off of each other because just to keep the process clean, but I, I could um, I could go back and see if they'd be willing to match. The thing to consider is how often you're using paralegal versus partner versus um, associate, but I have no issue with pushing back. All good answers, quality people that we have here, clearly, all, all of them. Um, very, very quick background. When uh, I was in a similar position on the Board of Education, education rates are actually extremely high for, for attorneys, much, much higher, in fact, more than double. Um, and we, in fact, did that. We brought in three great firms. All were competing for the same book of business as we all in our businesses, and even in personal lives, sort of negotiate our things. With, whether you're fixing your house or whatever, and we were able to reduce in that case, which is different than this case, but that case by about 30% because they wanted to book our, our asset enough, and whether it's their interest in gaining a foothold in an area or continuing to be a leader in their book of business, however it, it determined, it's determined, um, but they were able to match, and in fact, one of them would beat and say, look, you know, they're coming in at, let's say, 145, we'll go to 140. And at the end of the day, we're going to pick, of course, the lawyers that we think are best suited for the town. But there are many great lawyers that could be best suited for the town. And if it's a rate, if it's a value proposition, and we are looking at value here, you know, in a lot of areas, um, I would recommend that we do go back, even if it's for a week or so, we can call special meetings, and we see what is the lowest rate that they're willing to go to, <coughs> considering that each of them have competition within themselves. And we have in the past driven down rates by not one percentage point, significant percentage points. Um, and I think both will, will provide a good value there. So with that, I'd like to listen to other comments, but I would make a motion to table at the end so that we can do that process and then come back with what we believe the final rates can be. I would just like to say these rates are significantly reduced as it is. It's almost as if it's I mean, this is in a way like a public service that they're providing these services at rates that are significantly less than their rates. I thought it was interesting when the Board of Ed, you said, were, you know, the rates you guys were getting were like double. And so you were able to get it down 30 percent, which is great, but that would still be more than. I mean, I, I was actually shocked at how low these rates are. I also, but I do think it's a fair point, and I, I was actually... I think I had brought it up, I asked G the town manager, and he did mention about keeping the RFP process clean because is it fair to pit two of the 
law firms against each other when you know what about the others who didn't have you know it's it's just I don't know it seems like in the interest of fairness you give us your best rates and we'll go with that um, but generally I agree with you it's we should be negotiating but in this case I thought maybe it wasn't wise because I knowing that the rates are already significantly reduced and then to try and keep the process clean I don't know mm -hmm. what you guys think uh, Mike um, Dolores noted that slight correction the it's only ten dollar difference for the uh, not the lead attorney but the associate it's, it's not 20 so it's a ten dollar difference um, Halloran and Sage is ten dollars more than Ro McGuigan an hour but then on the paralegal side it is a twenty dollar difference um, yeah for just so that the record is completely accurate uh, this is a question for the subcommittee you had said the rates are are obviously comparable as far as the size of the actual firms do you know just or at least able to estimate how different the sizes are yeah so Roma McGuigan has 11 attorneys I, I believe they used to be larger but they've um, but right now they have 11 I and Halloran Sage is about 102 I think thank you I guess I have a question on a follow-up to that with with 11 attorneys, when we ask a question of an attorney in there, I mean, would they be able to turn around information with 11 attorneys as quick as a, a larger firm with more depth and more breadth of, um, of attorneys, and, you know, outside of what Mr. Slater may have purview over, would he be able to get research and answers done quicker through a larger firm? In fairness, I have no way of actually knowing that, um, but I will say my experience with Jack uh, Bradley from Roe McGuigan is he turned things around um, expeditiously. Okay. I had no issues with that, and working with other law firms and other communities, um, you know, a bench of 11 is, is still pretty substantial. Um, you know, to me, it's more about the breadth and knowledge that they have. Now, you could have 100 attorneys, you ask one one question, you could get three different answers from three different, different ones answers. down, right. Um, so to me, it's about um, how much knowledge, you know, those one or two attorneys are bringing to the table. Can they answer it when you make the phone call to them versus let me get back to you because I have to do the research. I think in that fact, they're evenly matched. Um, I've worked with both, both law firms um, uh, in other communities. Um, so, you know, I can speak to that they're probably even. Okay. when it comes to their knowledge level and skill set. Thank you. And then maybe for the attorneys uh, at the table, the use of a paralegal versus an associate versus a partner. Um, would we rely more on a paralegal or would firms rely more on paralegal? Would they rely on, you know, I'm just thinking of, you know, if there's a $28 an hour difference in paralegal and their, you, their work is more prevalent than anybody else's work or is it, Everything's pretty much comparable. I think it's really task based. If okay. you're at a trial, the, par the paralegal's not show not going to show up and do the trial, obviously. But you know, a good firm, and I both of these are good firms. They they will, um, if it is a simple simple motion that a paralegal can draft and a quick review by an attorney in order to be efficient and, and cost effective about it, they'll they'll do that. And so it really is. Uh, if you're collecting documents, for example, that could be very task heavy for a paralegal. Rather than rather than a lawyer, if you're at trial, be very task heavy for a lawyer and a paralegal, and of course the in between the research. Uh, is that fair, Mary? To say? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and a lot of these things, it, and that you know, especially in a litigation context, I think like a lot of these things, you have a quick question, you would call up the partner, and they did mention at the meeting, like uh, they these are. All the ones we've met with, they all have decades of experience in representing municipalities. So a lot of them just know the answer because they don't have to send it off to have research done by an associate or paralegal because they, they have seen so many things before that have come up through the years. So I, I think that's one of the advantages of having a, a you know, a established firm with experience, a lot of experience in this area. And they both are, you know, have this, but where they can just answer the question without spending an hour of, you know, researching an issue. Okay. Any further questions, comments? Um, Councilor how, how long has Rome been um, 
council through the town? Mm. I believe uh, six years. Is, has that always been Attorney Bradley who's been our main point of contact as far as? Yeah. First start, I believe so. Yep. And has prior, right? prior to Roe McGuigan in 2014, <coughs> it was Haller and Sage. And has there any, has there any been, there's been no issue with Attorney Bradley for six years, kind of clean marks as far as? You know, maybe the former mayor or um, when I was mayor we had no um, issues with him he was responsive um, got back to us um, he was on task we had some difficult issues the two years that I was mayor and I would say he did a very good job helping me navigate through them so um, I'm I'm very comfortable with uh, Ron McGuigan thank you thanks counselor Thanks, Mayor. I'd like to move to uh, table this uh, for an indefinite period to the designation of the mayor uh, to be able to continue on negotiations to um, attempt for a higher rate. And with that, I think of our deputy mayor who would- Higher rate or lower rate? Uh, lower rate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. We would have taken it. Miss, oh, yeah. Misspoken, misspoken. Yep. So we can continue to negotiate to a lower rate. I'll second that. Motion to table has been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. 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 Ayes have it. Dolores, do you need a vote count? No. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I, I would like to make a motion to appoint Haller and Sage as the town attorney per section 503 of the town charter. I second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Post nay? Nay. Ayes have it. Dolores, do you need that one? No. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Moving right along. Uh, bids. We have town engineer Derek Greger here. Um, B4A, spring paving program. Just bear with me. Just a quick intro and then I'll give it to, thank you, Mayor, a uh, quick intro and then I'll give it over to Derek. This is part of the, uh, the paving program that we do twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall. We are coming into the springtime. Uh, the first item before A is related to um, issuing a new purchase order for $450,000 and uh, Derek, I'll let you fill in, Derek Greger, town engineer, to fill in uh, the detail. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, as I've typically come before you every year as part of our annual paving program, as Gary said, this is specific to our spring program. Um, the state over the winter uh, had issued a uh, request for proposals for new pricing for 2020 for pavement. Um, this is a contract that the town has used for many years. A lot of municipalities use it. Um, typically, it's such a high volume of material, we usually get very good prices on the tonnage. A low bid uh, for th for the Weathersfield area is Tilcon. Uh, I don't usually get to say this, but their costs are actually six to ten percent lower than they were last year. Um, so we do get a benefit in that respect as far as the uh, unit pricing. The roads are listed uh, on your agenda item as the roads that we're proposing to do this spring. Uh, those are generated from our, our tentative five-year program that was developed a number of years ago. Uh, has been approved by our paving advisory committee. Uh, generally, these roads are chosen by um, the fact that we have some high volumes. We're doing some work in the vicinity of these roads. Um, Cul-de-sacs we try to include when we can. And uh, two of the roads, uh, you, some of you may remember from last year, Mill Street and Executive Square. We had a delay from last fall due to MDC's project as well as some private developments that are going on in the area. So we moved those to this spring. In general, the 2020 program is a pretty aggressive program. Um, typically, we've been spending about 1.2 million per year. Um, the last couple fiscal years, town council has allocated an additional $300,000 to get more road work done. So with that and the fact that we had to move <coughs> a couple of the roads from last fall to this spring, um, we're, we're being pretty aggressive uh, with that to try and get as much um, done this year as we can. 
So for this particular item, um, as Gary stated, this is a request to issue a new port purchase order to Tilcon based on their new contract with the state that is currently um, being finalized. Generally, in the past, I've come to you after it's been finalized. The problem we've had is the state often takes quite a while to get it done, and it's delayed our programs because we've had to wait for them till end of March, mid end of March. So, what I'm looking for is approval to award based on what I'm specifying here as the state contract. I don't anticipate any changes. If there were changes, I would come back to you for approval for those, but I'd like approval so when it is awarded that we can proceed with uh, contracting with Tilcon and moving forward. Sure. Great. Any questions in favor? I'll make a comment. Um, thank you. I'm glad to see my street is on this list, and I will say that I had no part in creating the list at all, and I'm laughing with the mayor that once I was no longer mayor, my road got put on the list. So thank you, Mayor Rell, for, <laughs> for, for helping my spot. street along. <laughs> I did it for the Logans across the street. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know she's put in some requests, some work orders for the potholes in front yeah, of her house. Yeah, that's a big but, um, you know, and all, all joking, I know it's gone through a process and gone through a computer um, system, but it was funny to see my street on here this year. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any other comments, questions? Gary, Councilor can Parker? You, uh, HMA, PMA, an acronym? Oh, uh, hot mix asphalt is what we typically use here in town. Um, the PMA is a, is a different type of material. I, I want to say it's maybe plastic mixed asphalt. It's got some different materials in it. Um, I haven't had any experience with that in particular, um, but hot mix asphalt is what HMA stands for. And then the S in the number refers to the um, general uh, size of the stone in the mix. So we have different variations that we use depending on what we're doing. Um, just a quick comment. Uh, I see Jordan uh, Jordan Lane here from Hartford to Silestine, and it just reminds me, uh, how are we on the uh, gateway southbound from Hartford into and northbound out of Weathersfield on Wolcott Hill and Jordan Lane? How's that project? Yeah, the lots of Progress. project. Yep. Um, yes. Uh, at this point, I'm putting together an RFP to get an engineer on board to do the design. Um, you know, depending on the schedule, availability, permitting, and going through the whole lots of process that we have to go through, I'm hoping to get into construction next year. Okay, so we would definitely see this spring project started before that one. Yes, this this would be, I'm anticipating a late April start. Okay, great, thank you. Good, okay, do I have a motion? I'd like to make a motion to issue a new purchase order for $450,000 to Tilcon Connecticut Inc in order to furnish and place bituminous concrete during the next paving program. Motion's been made. Can I get a second? Second. Motion second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Thank you. Not to go too far. We got another one up for you. This I believe um, is for the, the actual you know, side work that would be done by General paving, I believe, on this one. Uh, this the next item is the milling and re reclamation. Oh, no. yeah. okay. okay. So similar to the bituminous uh, contract with the state, uh, we typically work off the state bid. They had bid uh, their last contract for 2019 and 2020. So I'm proposing to use the same contract we used last year. Um, this is for milling and uh, pavement reclamation work that we do as part of the program. Roads are either milled, uh, take two inches off, two inches put back on, or if they're in that bad of shape and we have sub-base issues, then we would do a reclamation project, which is grinding up the existing pavement, making a new base, and putting a whole new pavement lift in. So this is the work in preparation for the bituminous that we would apply with the previous um, item that I had requested. Gotcha. Okay. So... Um, yeah, and, and this is this is for Tilcon again. Um, we used them last year. Uh, we do find it works out much better to have the same contractor doing both phases of the work uh, for scheduling and coordination. Okay, I'd like to make a motion to increase existing purchase order number two zero one six eight seven seven nine by thirty five thousand dollars for Tilcon Connecticut Inc. to mill and reclaim roads during the next paving program. 
Motion has been made. Can I get a second? Second. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank you. And here's the uh, paving prep work. Okay. Uh, so next item is the uh, third component of our paving programs. Um, General Paving has been working for the town since 2005. They are currently working under a contract with the town that was an extension through 2021. Um, what they do as part of this program is they assist staff. Um, they provide minor, minor drainage improvements, road patching, curb apron replacements. Um, they remove excess material when we do reclamation projects. So they are there and available to work with our contractor, Tilcon, to get the, keep things moving and get things done. Um, they also address issues with access to private properties and just help with the overall coordination of the program. So <clears throat> this particular uh, item request is just to increase their existing PO. We had some funds left from last year, so this is just an increase to get me to a point is based on my estimate what I'm going to need for them to get this program done. Uh, it does include some deep surface repairs, which are deep surface pavement rehabilitation in other areas. From time to time, we find that just filling potholes is not adequate in certain locations. So we'll have them come in, cut out the road, put a new base in. So when we do get to a road paving project, that work's already done, which would be required anyway. So this includes a little bit of that, that we use them where needed as we go through the program. Gotcha. Any questions or comments from anybody? Quick, quick clarification. <clears throat> Did you say that sometimes they, they provide actual hauling of surplus reclaim material? Yes, yeah. that's correct. So is that due to the town not having the staffing to do that work, or is it just what was the rationale for that? Historically, the town crews did provide that service. Um, we've been very aggressive with our programs in recent years to get more work done, um, which has led, we have so many roads that are in such poor shape, we have a lot of reclamation type projects. And in uh, this, this past year was when we, they decided that really it was getting to be too time consuming for them to be available on the contractor schedule. Um, so we had uh, been talking with physical service, director of physical services. We've been utilizing just for the last two programs, general paving to provide that service for us. In lieu of our staff on overtime. Uh, that's correct. Thank you. Any additional questions, comments? I'll take a lead from Councillor Forrest from last year. Um, we did notice that when Main Street and Garden Street was done, that there were some concerns around potholes. Those that, you know, as you make the turn on, on from Maine to uh, um, Wells or vice versa, some of those potholes are right in the middle of the, the drive lane for your, you know, where you're driving over. Um, just one thing, you know, make sure that the, uh, you know, general paving is considerate of any kind of sewer or, you know, utility covers that are there. Um, you know, I don't want to be going back and having to redo work that's already been done so yeah that issue came up with the low manholes um the pavement was higher than the manholes in that particular area unfortunately those manholes happened to be in the wheel path so yes, it created some path. problems so that was an issue we've uh, addressed with tilcon they've made the repairs on their own dime because that was a mistake on their crews okay. um you know we've had conversations with them because we didn't notify them of that problem at the time uh, the foreman on site refused to address it so we brought it up with management. They've assured us that won't happen again. They will get that address. So we shouldn't have that problem. Typically, we don't have that problem. That was kind of an unusual case. They really just put back uh, the pavement lift a little thicker. We do put rings into those manhole covers, uh, frames, to try and get them at the right height. And it was kind of an odd size at that particular time. They didn't have the right rings on site. So yeah, we've, we've done what we can to address that right. so we don't have that issue. In the OK, perfect. I appreciate it. I'd like to make a motion to increase existing purchase order number 201-76881 by $250,000 for general paving to complete site preparation and restoration work, drainage improvements, and additional support services associated with the town's next paving program. Motion's been made. Can I get a second? Second. second. Motion's made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Eyes have it, motion carries. Thank you. And last one from you, Derek. I believe this is the uh, seal coating, crack yeah. sealing. <coughs> yes, um, annually the town allocates a certain amount of funds. So typically we've been allocating $100,000 to pavement maintenance. 
Um, that is going out to roads and sealing cracks um, when they start to develop so we can keep the water out of the base materials. Um, it does extend the longevity of the road. Um, given that we're still kind of playing catch up on getting our roads up to speed, um, you know, we've done assessments and feel that's a worthwhile expenditure uh, to do. So what we've done historically is use the CROG uh, bids that they had uh, gotten in. We've, in town since 2013, used a uh, polymer and chrome rubber modified sealant, which is a little different than a traditional sealant because it has fibers and polymers in it that allow for more um, expansion ability. So um, my opinion in, in talking to a lot of other municipalities that use it, it's a better product. Um, it's something we've been using for a while. I've been hesitant to change from it because it seems like we've had pretty good luck with it. So for that particular item, um, steel coating was the only bidder for it. Um, they were at $13.18 per gallon. Um, just for comparison, uh, under the same bids, there were maybe five or six different contractors bidding. The, the traditional material without the additional fibers in it ranged from $10 to $18.98 per gallon. Um, I did take a look at DOT's contract to see if they had any better pricing. Um, DOT uses a traditional uh, sealant without the fibers. Their pricing uh, from their contract was about $15 to $16 for, per gallon. So in context, um, that price uh, I think is reasonable for the product that we're getting. They do high volume, they do a lot of municipalities in the area, which is why their pricing is pretty competitive even against uh, a material that um, is more traditional and not the um, what we would consider a modified improved uh, type of product. So um, you know, generally, like I said, we, I feel we get more longevity out of it. Um, this would be $100,000 to steel coating. Uh, the staff, we look at roads that we've paved in the last five to eight years and we try to go back and hit those roads. Um, we also evaluate other roads and try and do it where we can to get as much life out of the roads as we can before we have to come in with a milling and paving project or a reclaim project. Gotcha. Um, so, well, well, please. Well, I just had a question. So the seal coat is the only one who bid this product, is that right? They're the only ones who bid this particular product. Um, it's somewhat proprietary. It's a, a particular mix that they that they use. There was one other bidder, I would say, with, which was probably a comparable product. Uh, pro <coughs> product, I'm sorry, that is on that was listed in there as well. Um, I've I'm I'm not convinced. I want to go to that product yet. I've talked. I've gotten some references that I wasn't too keen on as far as using it. So they were. Uh, maybe like less than a dollar a gallon cheaper um, for the, for something that has a, a modification to it, but um, you know I, I feel at this point more comfortable sticking with what we've been using. It's been it's been it's been working for us, so that'd and be my recommendation. And when you bid it out, did you bid it out generally? It was not a s you didn't bid it out specifically to a type of sealant. It was just a general bid, so that's why <coughs> you received all these other all these other bids. When CROG puts out a bid, they solicit pricing, and the towns can utilize that pricing for contracting with a particular vendor. Mm -hmm. So the way they structured their bid is they everyone bid on either lineal foot, pounds, or gallons for just tr traditional sealant, and then they allowed for alternative bids if certain companies, and there were a couple of them that had a different product that they wanted to put out and make available to the municipalities, that's where seal coating falls into that mix. Okay, because I definitely had trouble reading the <laughs> reading this format and figuring out why this price was so much higher than everybody else's bid. But I understand now that it's you're, you know we're not comparing apples and apples in this bid, which is kind of unusual. Thank you. Just one quick question, um, PCRM, and you're comfortable with that type of material? We've been doing that for. We've been doing yeah. it for about the past seven, six, seven years or so. Okay. Um, you may remember at one time we were doing that in mulch, uh, mulch sealant, which we got away from uh, due to some of the we do remember difficulties that. with that. Um, so in the last few years, we've been just using exclusively um, this this product. Gotcha. Which is this the one that is on Griswold? No, actually, uh, Griswold and Thornbush Road are kind of unique. Um, <coughs> The joints, the longitudinal joints where the paving meets up, was starting to separate. The rest of the road is in pretty good shape, mm -hmm. but that. So with that particular material, we had a different contractor come in and put in a um, higher grade mix, which is more what they use at airports. So it's different than what this contract and what we normally do gotcha. um, to seal up those areas. 
So that that's a little bit of a different case, and it's a different mm -hmm. material. Yeah, I remember when you came in for that, and then it's just i got to be honest, every time I drive over, I always think of that committee meeting, that this is that special material, that, and it's held up. I mean, it's held up winter after winter, five, six years, seasons, heat, cold, all that. So I haven't used it before, but um, I think it's held up pretty well, considering um, you know, what I was hoping to get out of it. So the idea with that is we, we wanted a better product than even this and something mm -hmm. more durable because the, the cracks were actually larger than what we normally would be sealing as gotcha. part of this contract. Okay. Oh, Mr. Town Manager, or Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, sorry. Um, Derek, just a little Lose it. technical question on the application. Do we have staff on site when they're doing this crack sealing? We do. And I've noticed some streets where, you know, it's like spider cracks. There's, there's cracks everywhere, and I see them putting crack sealer on where, to me, it's like somebody should tell them, you're wasting your time, skip the next 20 feet and move on because it's just a waste of time and money it's yeah we, we make a judgment call on if the road is suitable for a crack seal or it really is at a point where it's a mill and overlay so you know honestly sometimes we might be trying to save a road that's really beyond saving and we just need to wait a few years and actually get it on a paving list but uh, we do our best with the staffing we have to have someone on site with them to make sure they are blowing out the cracks and you know, to be there in case we want to make some changes. So that has happened from time to time. Um, from time to time, we've gotten complaints from residents. They just don't like the way that looks. You know, part of the problem is, you know, we were very limited in our funding, so we're trying to stretch our dollars as much as we can. So aesthetically, it's not the best look, um, but we, we do make a judgment call on when we feel it's warranted or when it's not. I don't have a problem with the aesthetics, but sometimes it's like a case where there's no way they're going to get them all anyways. There's so many of them. And I can imagine being the guy applying it like this is well last year we futile. we did we did make a change in how we quantify we went from going from pounds to gallons because we found it's a lot easier for us to track the gallons uh, pounds was a little more complicated to know how much are they actually putting in so at least from that perspective I feel like we're getting what we're paying for because we go out daily with them and say all right you apply this many gallons each day and then we you know we pay them based on that so I think it is a little tighter as far as keeping track on what they're doing fair enough thanks Okay, no other further questions, comments? I get a motion. I'd like to make a motion to issue a new purchase order for $100,000 to seal coating ink to complete asphalt crack sealing of roads using the hot pouring method. Motion's been made. Second. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, Derek. We appreciate it. Thanks for sticking around tonight. No overtime. <laughs> um, next we got coming up um, both Mike O'Neill and Jim from IT talk about um, WAN and uh, yeah, connectivity between the uh, town buildings and you know, some new technology switches and we appreciate you guys sticking around. Welcome. <laughs> I was just going to say, I, I, I yield my time to the Honorable uh, Michael O'Neill and Jim DeReagan. Uh, we'll be efficient in the interest of time. Um, this item is a, uh, it, it's a renewal. We're, we're uh, recommending the town uh, stay with the same vendor, a renewal of our wide area network for the town. This is a optical fiber network that connects all town locations, 11 locations, that's buildings and radio shelters, uh, fiber optic connections, it's all the uh, switching equipment at each location, uh, it's security equipment, firewalls, um, there's two devices for that. It's also uh, 24 hour a day, seven day a week monitoring of the network. Anytime there's an outage, uh, the, the vendor contacts us within 60 minutes of, of anything that they're seeing on their monitoring equipment, and they also provide four-hour replacement of the equipment. Um, we started this process. The, the current seven-year contract expired in November. Um, we started uh, working with vendors back in May. Um, we talked to three vendors. Digital Back Office is our current provider, uh, Cox uh, Business Services, and Frontier 
Um, the options here are obviously fairly limited to companies that, that have a presence. Um, Cox was ruled out uh, fairly quickly. They did present us with a proposal, but one of our radio shelters is on the roof at Executive Square, and they did not have a circuit that went up to the roof. Uh, both Digital Back Office and Frontier have a circuit there, so that that would have required Cox to spend quite a bit of money that that you know they would have been recouping from the town to uh, to put that circuit in. So. Um, by late summer, it was down to just Frontier and uh, Digital Back Office. We went back and forth quite a bit with both vendors. Um, they did both did a great job. You can see just a, there's a brief summary of the proposals. Um, both uh, proposed a five-year arrangement. Digital Back Office was significantly lower. Uh, very late in the process, Digital Back Office came back to us. Again, we were kind of going back and forth and really um, trying to see what we could do here. We asked them to, if they could, uh, try to get to get down to where we are presently. Um, they were able to do that with an offer of going for seven years rather than five years. So the cost is $119,000 a year. That's what we pay now. That's what we paid seven years ago. So it's um, we feel good about that. There's also um, would be about $19,000, almost $20,000 of upfront costs for uh, implementation services and uh, some of the uh, firewall equipment. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments? I, is, <clears throat> is it the town leases the fiber or do these two different vendors have their own fiber and you get onto one or, or the other? So the vendors lease, they do lease that fiber from Crown Castle. Okay. Crown Castle owns all the fiber in this area. Okay. They lease it from them, then they package them, and then they offer us that package. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That'd be Mayor. A couple questions. Um, they're extending the contract basically seven years. So why is there a one-time cost for implementing implementation and equipment if it's already up and running are we adding something else or? so we are and what we're adding here is next generation firewalls and that's what we need here to fight cybersecurity. Okay. so our current firewall our current firewalls do not scan for cyber threats and this is what we need we need that next generation security that's what these firewalls will provide us so with that comes their their help and their implementation of it <coughs> That allows them to warranty these products. We will manage these products internally after they're installed and running. We will also interface with that vendor on the installation process. And, and again, after it's done, we will manage them fully, but in order for the warranty to extend, they have to have a hand <coughs> in the installation, and that's where that cost comes from. The, the other thing I wanted to ask is, does. Uh, this system gets to the high school, I see on the chart, on the map there. Does the Board of Ed have, do they use digital back office to link the other schools? Mm -hmm. and yes, yes we do. And that was the thought process here. Since we are shared service, I'm the network administrator for the uh, school and the town. Um, and in order for our, our, our IT components who move back and forth in a shared service environment, um, we like same same. Right. And of course it's very cost effective. Um, so having same same both configs on both sides, we do use the same firewalls that the town is getting. So I can move back and forth, configuring, setting up, um, and taking man managing firewalls, edge equipment, fiber optic lines, and so on. Yeah. So is it's very cost effective. <coughs> is there a reason why it's two separate contracts? Or well, I know you got the price way down, but is there, would there be any cost savings in bidding it out as everything in town rather than? So generally, we were always on a different schedule because we were not shared service. We, were, we, we became shared service, I think, about two and a half years ago. So, you know, we're starting to look down that road. It's just at this moment, these contracts are not lining up. Right. But down the road, we would like to do that. Uh, we will be assessing our WAN on the school side in 2022 is when our contract comes up. So we will, we're going to look on the school side to see with DBO to get the same package as we are now. Um, but get it so that in the next contract cycle, we, we may do a five-year, mm -hmm. 
and then we can line that up and start to look at, we are looking down the road of one very large town network, school and town. Um, that'll help become a little more cost effective also. Thank you. So we are moving in that direction, yes. One question I did have, and I, I, I think you guys touched on it uh, in an, another discussion, I think with the library board, is that the VoIP phones, yes. would this help with that integration so that you know we can relieve some of the, the need of staff over at, at least at the library from having to answer phones? I mean, that, you know, you get prompts. So the, all network subsystems will run on this WAN, and we call it a WAN. That's the fiber optic lines, all the equipment that connects it, plus our firewalls. So that is our WAN, a wide area network. Our VoIP phones, that's the next project moving forward we're going to start on. Cameras, computers, printers, shared services as far as uh, file sharing and so on, internet connections. These all run on this basic network. So, but that doesn't help with staffing or how folks want to okay. uh, roll that, that out. It's not going to help as far as staffing goes. Right. But, um, you know, this, it, is, it, 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 this network is a little, it's just a conduit. Got it. Okay. Right, to expand but, services. But you need that conduit before you can go to the next level. Correct. Yes. And then that is ultimately the plan in the next couple of years looking at. Yes. Yep. Going yes. forward. Okay. Thank you. I get a motion. I would make a motion to award a seven-year contract for an optical fiber wide area network and related maintenance and support services in the amount of $119,181 annually, plus one-time cost for items stated above in the amount of $19,825 to digital back office. Motion's made and can I get a second? Second. Made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. <coughs> it carries. Thank you, guys. And I think we got to keep you for one more item. Um, Thank you. Yep. Jim, yep. Yes. Uh, uh, Mike on the. Uh, the um, next item is a renewal of our contract with Tyler Technologies for the hosting and software for our financial management system. Um, we are on a five, or th I'm sorry, a three-year cycle with Tyler for our financial system, Munis. Um, that contract expires at the end of this fiscal year, June 30th, and uh, this is just, uh, this would be to award the contract for another three years. Um, we do have a quote from Tyler. They're proposing uh, what would be for the total three-year cost of 5.18% five, 5 increase which is slightly higher than the last, uh, last increase was, was just under uh, 5%. The cost is split uh, evenly between the town and the Board of Ed. Um, it would be under this proposal uh, $58,260 each for the town and the Board of Ed, which is about uh, $2,200 each per year increase. Any questions on Munis, Mr. Tom, uh, Deputy Mayor? Uh, Mike, it, does, uh, does this uh, Munis software provide the uh, visibility uh, option to put our uh, financials up on our website for public to view? Not, not with the modules that are proposed here, but they do have, they do have a transparency module. Can we get? A quote for that before yes. we approve this, or is this time sensitive, or what's the situation there? This is uh, just has to be approved before July 1st. Uh, I would like to, uh, you know, our effort is trying to be more transparent with the residents. I think the uh, ability to post our financials up on the website, town website, would be advantageous to everyone. Uh, not everybody's going to be interested in looking at it, but I think, uh, you know, with the budget problems that we're having, I think a lot of uh, what we need to do is, is, as education, you know, let people understand what, what costs we're struggling with and all these kind of uh, 
items and also extend it to the Board of Ed, but um, I would like to see that as an option. I don't know if it's a significant amount of money or just. But. Mr. Town Manager. Mayor, if I may, and thank you, Deputy Mayor, for bringing that up. Um, I guess my question is, is it something that needs to be resolved through a module? Or, and I mention that only because um, Michael and I have been having that conversation about how to how to produce certain formats uh, or financial information in a format that could be readable and available online through the website like in uh, other communities. I think a member in the audience actually brought it up uh, and, and mentioned a specific town, or it might have been you. So I'm, yeah, so I'm not, I guess my concern is I don't, I don't know if we have to wait for the module in order to do that, but I'll, I'll kind of defer to you since you have to produce the information. It's not, I mean, it, it's a module, so to speak. I mean, if you, there's a little bit of detail attached to this agenda item. It's not a module the way the accounts payable module is or the payroll. The, the transparency, the way all of them work is they, they really, you take information from the system put it in a, a separate database. Basically, you know, you, you export what amounts to an Excel file and then upload that into another product that's, that's just, that's basically a web server, which allows users to, you know, to drill into the information. So it's not, it's not a module, it's, it's a product that Tyler offers. It's not a tightly integrated module. I think it would be on a par with, with several other options. We looked at this, I think it was three years ago, um, <laughs> we looked at these products and it was, I don't think there's anything about the Tyler product, you know, that, that makes it exceptional because it's Tyler and because we have Munis, it functions as a, it's a web server that you would load information. It doesn't, it doesn't, you know, I think it could have a live link, but really any product could have a live, live link to the database if you wanted that. I kind of hate to uh, go, go forward with this if we don't have to uh, until July, I think you said. July uh, 1st. July 1st. Uh, I, I would hate to sign up for this uh, three-year contract and then find out, well, you know, you, you guys really should have told us that up front because now we're going to have to do X, Y, Z and buy some switches or WAN or something. So uh, I would suggest we table it and try to get a I hear idea where on the price. Um, would this be something you would be able to talk to the Tyler representatives about? And no. and they love talking about these things. <laughs> <laughs> and if you love talking back no, to them. No, they do. No, and I'm they love talking, love to talking us. back to them. Well, yeah. I will, you know, I'll do whatever, whatever needs to be done. Right. Um, any comments? Anybody have any questions or comments about? Uh, I, I do. I think one of the first things that both the deputy mayor and I had heard when we, you know, shortly after being elected in the fall was, you know, a more open and transparent government. And one thing that came to our attention was that model from East Hartford that had it was like their open checkbook, I think is what they called it, so that you could see, you know, money in, money out, where is it going? Um, and it would help, you know, the general public by, you know, opening up our books a little bit and seeing, you know, you know what are they getting for the, the, the amount of money that they're paying to the town. Um, I'm actually, I, if this is something that we could talk to Tyler about and then, um, you know, get a, a couple quotes from them, and if we've got uh, until July 1st, you know, I, I kind of agree. Why don't we do that for the sake of transparency? Anybody else have any questions or comments about that? That's a good idea. Okay. I might, I might suggest that we get a somehow ask them if they can break that out as a separate. Sure. You know, and then if it comes, if it's a huge amount of money that we're not going to be able to handle, then we could still move forward with the original quote. Does that sound fair? Sounds fair to me. I don't mind it. So I make a motion to table this item uh, and ask uh, Tyler to uh, provide a revised quote that would allow for visibility onto a uh, town website. Second. Motion to table has been made and seconded. Um, has there been a motion put on the table yet? 
for the actual shipping? I don't think so, no. So I think that we're just, we could pass it. Right. Are, we, are we moving to set this aside, set aside? I believe, for an yeah. indefinite time, or are we tabling it for today? Technically tabling means we bring it up in like five more minutes. We could set aside for an indefinite time, which means it gets put on the agenda. I'll table it for an indefinite period of time prior to July 1st. Second. Okay. And it gives you enough time to be able to contact representatives and yep. see if we can get something. Indefinite amount of time. Indefinite. <laughs> Up and well, so or, you, or you make a specific time. Yeah, you should yeah. 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 Well, I think, you know, with the intent that knowing July 1st deadline. Sure. So we'll have that in like legislative intent to keep it at the 4th, <laughs> um, July 1st. Thank you. Um, motion to the table. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion to the table carries. Thank you. And finally, uh, Mr. Town Manager, now the new B4A, or B4G, sorry. Thank you, Mayor, and to the Honorable Council. So. Um, what we have here, oh, that's right, at the beginning we already moved it. So what we have here is revisiting um, from the previous council meeting a request um, for the town manager to issue an RFP, a request for proposals for potential land lease agreements at Cove Park. Um, from the last meeting, there were a number of questions that came up, and what I've provided the council is kind of a memo um, analyzing what I would see as going into a request for proposals um, that would go out to the general public. My intent is to make this um, open and available to potential different types of opportunities, but also to narrow it down to something that has greatest and best use potentially for the park uh, to provide amenities to the residents, uh, create a draw for the community in a very acceptable and considerate manner um, for the surrounding neighborhood. And I'm happy to answer any questions that may have come up between now and then to help maybe make you feel a little bit more comfortable with what we're trying to achieve here. Any questions? Comments? Well, with, um, I see great opportunity here and to make a great lively uh, great lively area. Mr. Rue is not here to, to remind you. <laughs> I know, but the it's people, so in, to, the like people out in the TV middle. land can't hear you. Um, I'm wondering, is there any opportunity then for the adjacent property, I guess it's the state of Connecticut, and do we start having conversations with them if they're not using their back half, but we think that we can take advantage of this, or maybe there's some discussion that we can be had about expanding Cove Park to, addition, to have additional opportunities here, especially if the state of Connecticut not, is not utilizing that whole area. Um, it may be a prime opportunity while we're reviewing Cove Park to then see how we can possibly expand Cove Park, have some type of a partnership with the state, whatever opportunities particularly exist, which may expand the opportunities of this RFP. I didn't know if that was being looked into at all, if it's possible to be looked into. Um, we obviously don't really get as much pilot, so maybe this is a nice, uh, uh, you know, we are the we house, so to speak. You know, some of our uh, some of our best land is is owned by the state, and maybe this is a good partnership that we could have with them. Food for thought, but it's sort of it is apropos with what we're talking about here, though. So is that an opportunity, Mr. Town Manager? Thank you. Um, I'll start with I think there's always an opportunity, so I would never look the other way. Um, I would say that I almost want to lead by example. Um, this might be kind of the launching pad for that. Look at the success that we can achieve X, Y, and Z, and we'd like to move it further down the road. Um, I'm not exactly sure which s component of the state parcel are you speaking about more where the DMV is and kind of where it abuts um, the fields for us. 
Yeah, and, and it's and I and I don't I don't have a plot map in front of me, obviously, but I just didn't know if it was closer back to, where to the we cove, are. I think, or at some point, state land ma- ma- meets the cove. Yeah, so I think I think there's definitely a larger opportunity. I think you have a number of um, of barriers to. You, first of all, you want to be cautious as to how you develop it and considerate of the, the history. Sure. Um, you're also sitting in floodplain, and you also have some interesting elevation there. So we would have to be really careful with how we approached it. And I think this, to me, is kind of that lead off of, here's what we're doing down this end. Um, we show that we can develop appropriately and considerately um, and um, then look for those other opportunities <coughs> to try to expand and... and um, and maybe change the elevation because once you get to the DMV side, you are actually out of the floodplain. Well, mm, partially out of the floodplain enough where you could um, uh, uh, tie in and, and um, build momentum. I guess my the quick to that is I think this is the catalyst for um, going to that next step. Okay, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I. Uh I have to disagree with this proposal. I, uh, I have looked at a number of plans that exist that the town put a lot of time and effort and money into. Uh, master plan, the Cove plan, the Harbor plan, uh, Old Weathersfield Village Improvement, I think it's called. Uh, I didn't find anywhere in any of those documents any intent to commercialize Cove Park or any any park in town. Um, I think it's a, a natural open space parcel and uh, I don't think we should be leading down that path of commercializing it even if it's a, a seasonal type situation. I don't think the residents of Main Street deserve that kind of, if it is becomes popular that there's going to be additional traffic going up and down Main Street into the Cove. Uh, I could envision noise, smells, uh, dumpster service driving down there to remove trash every day or every other day. Uh, And I just don't think that was the intent of Cove Park. So I would have to disagree with this plan. Thank you. Any additional comments, questions, Councilor Parker? I mean, I think there there could be issues, but I think the RFP is structured in a way that's pretty high bar, and I think uh, we should at least put it out there to see what the response is, and we can examine it. I don't I don't want to close the door. Um, I respect Tom's concerns, but I just at the same time we're talking about trying to support a full school budget yet. You know, businesses want low mill rates, so earning revenue outside of the property tax is one way, and maybe it's not much, and then maybe it, it's not worthwhile. But I think we at least have to go through the motion and, and see what's out there. That's kind of where I am on it. Thank you. Councillor Hill. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I agree with uh, Councillor Parker. I mean, there's enough belts and suspenders on um, the RFP. Uh, a concerned amount of hoops to jump through that it would really would only take some serious um, uh, folks moving forward in order to put anything down at Cove Park. And if the biggest concern is that it's a huge success, then I'm, I'm willing to take that risk. Thank you. Councillor Bella. Um, I had some concerns at the last meeting about it too. After talking with the, the town manager, he did alleviate some of those um, concerns in that again, like Councillor um, Parker and Hill said, the vetting process is pretty thorough um, and they will be going through, any any business that's interested will be going through, um, I guess what I would say, some of our toughest boards and commissions to get through. Um, it looks like the lineup includes um, Candidates being selected are required to present to the Park and Rec Board, the Heritage Tourism Commission, the Harbor Management Commission, the Planning and Zoning Commission, the Economic Development Improvement Commission, and others as appropriate. So I I am going to put my faith 
in the people that we've appointed to serve on these boards and commissions to do their due diligence. They'll hold public hearings um, that will allow members of our public to speak and for residents of the neighborhood um, to be heard. I do live in Old Weathersfield on the other side of the cove and I would be happy to walk over there and not drive down Main Street to take part in um, something that was of interest to me. I love the cove, but I do think it's underutilized. Um, and if we can find an appropriate type of business to put down there, um, you know, for five or six months of the year, I would support that. So I am supporting this uh, motion today. Thank you. Yeah, and yeah, I, think you just, I, I, I think you just nailed it. And, uh, you know, I, I obviously respect uh, Tom's concerns and those are all things I think we need to be privy of. But also as a council, I think we need to be open to, to new economic development opportunities like this one. Um, if we sit here and, and, you know, talk about actively trying to lower taxes or bring new businesses to town, I think the way that this is structured is, is kind of just an open-ended conversation as to what could potentially go down there. And like Kevin said, and Amy also elaborated on, you're going through a pretty rigorous process mm -hmm. before it's even uh, put to us to make a final decision on it. So I think whoever ultimately is going to end up going there is going to already have been through all these hoops and I think that they want to be active in their community. Okay. Oh. I'll just, just to jump in, I am strongly in favor of this. Like I said at the last meeting, um, I think that the Cove has a lot of unrealized potential and I would be happy to see something go in there. And Again, I do think that all the hoops, there's like too many hoops to jump through, <laughs> really. So it would be nice to be able to streamline the process, and not just for this, but in general, to make it easier on businesses. And I think it, the town does make it a little difficult to open a new business. There's just, just too many hoops. And I, I agree with Councillor Forrest I, in that I would love to see not just one little thing go down there, but it would be great if this is the start of something more because I think there's so much potential at the Cove <coughs> And along the back of the DMV, you see all this residue or, you know, these material. It's just sort of like they dump stuff back there in that trail, you know, behind the DMV. Um, and it's just, just uh, you know, it's just sitting there. So anyways, I'm in strongly in favor of this. There is a source to see cleanup coming up uh, <laughs> sometime in April uh, around Earth Day that uh, you can take part in and clean up that area. So I think... <laughs> Um, we've all, <laughs> yep, we've done it. Um, without any further questions or comments, you know, I, I do have to agree. You know, I'm not going to reiterate the hoops comments, but uh, there are a number of um, boards and commissions that we put uh, uh, our confidence in those that we've appointed to them to uh, to make uh, you know right decisions. That it, it falls under their purview. I would hope that they. Um, they have the experience and the expertise to be able to, um, you know, vet any concerns through that, th through their own public boards and public meetings to be able to come up with a correct decision. Um, with that, I'll make a motion to authorize town manager to develop and publish a uh, request for proposals to provide recreational, entertainment, dining, food services, and other amenities in Cove Park, and to execute an agreement reviewed by council with any selected respondents. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Nay. Ayes have it. Dolores, do you need? Mr. Mayor, may I make one comment? Could we ask um, the town manager to indicate to council when um, an item is going before a board or commission that has to do with town property? Um, I will admit I don't always read all of the boards and commissions agendas. Um, I know, life gets busy. Um, and there was, uh, there was an issue with something that went before HDC that we probably should have done some advocacy for, uh, whether one or two of us spoke at the meeting or, you know, explained to the, the um, commissioners the importance of town property. Um, and I think it, it would just be good for council members to know when town property items are on different boards and commissions agendas so we can, we can speak out if we see good fit. Point. Yes, definitely. I think I know which item you may be <laughs> referring to. Yes. <laughs> we can talk about it. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, without any further business, I believe we've got uh, minutes before you in your packet. Take a minute or two to review. There's no questions or comments on those. No questions or comments? All those in favor of? Oh, I need a motion. I need a motion. Need a motion to, to make approve motion. the minutes as presented for the February 3rd, 2020 meeting. Second. Motion is made and seconded. All those in favor of signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Minutes have been adopted. Now back to public comment. Anybody wishing to speak for the second time or first time for anybody who's come in since then? Mr. Young. Good evening again, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. As I was saying, I was talking regarding uh, um, Jack Bradley and, the, and his actions against the citizens of Weathersfield back during the Keisha Farm purchase. And uh, I, I believe, I'm, I'm glad tonight that you decided not to hire him and his firm and, and I will always come to this podium going forward to say the same thing. You should not hire him ever again. What he did to the citizens of this town was bad by putting out a note that we're not allowed to see an appraisal for a property when in fact we're the ones that were going to pay for it. We paid for the appraisal and we were going to pay for the property which was sold to the town at a horrendous price, way, way too much. And we didn't even have a plan for it. Now we have some, outs uh, some insiders who are going to decide what's going to happen with that property. But anyway, I got to move along. Um, you, you talked a lot about tonight about uh, paving, uh, sealing cracks. Uh, you know, Weathersfield has not historically been very good about having good roads. Our roads are poor. And I don't know why. I mean, we spend a lot of money. And I've often said I think it's a poor quality product that we end up getting from our contractors, whoever put, put that asphalt down. As a matter of fact, on Griswold Road, just where Highland Street is, but on Griswold, th 20 or 30 feet, it feels like there's a hole being developed in near the middle of the road, just 20 feet, 30 feet back from the stop sign line. You can feel it as you go into it. So, and that's, that was a strip that was put in only a year or two ago. So I don't know, there seems like a big hole. You might want to send uh, Derek out and have him look at it. But that, that to me is poor quality. And I'm sure we paid a good dollar for it. Uh, tonight, there was a number of issues that people brought up, uh, numerous ones, uh, such as talking about bringing people together, uh, keep people informed. There's lack of transparency. Being engaged and how do you engage and get information out to people. Um, we need to increase our communications. Yes, we need to do a lot of that. Unfortunately, it takes a town council to do that. And the former town council that we had did an extremely poor job of sending out any information on certain issues. Yes, they, they can snuggle up with Ms. Uh, uh, Cohen and talk about certain issues. But when it came down to real issues, this council, the former council, was absolutely the worst, absolutely the worst as far as getting information out such as that Keisha Farm appraisal. So <clears throat> it really takes people at the council level to do something. I'm glad tonight, I believe uh, Mr. Mazzarella was talking about the uh, getting something up online for financials. You know, I think they call it, put, put the checkbook up. I've been asking about that for a number of years. Just, it's just a listing. 
of every check that's cut has a whatever documents that have to go along with it and of course the dollar amounts and I think if people could go in there and really see something like that it, 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 they would understand where the money's going and then they would be down here telling you where we need to cut because when you do look at those dollars there are some that there's no way I mean I don't understand how we we pay money that we do and to places that we do I won't say any words of vendors but I have in the past but anyway I, I really believe that uh, something something has to be done communication wise because uh, we citizens have gotten hammered over the years and especially the last years um, by not having information that we should have had anyway um, I also was kind of like disturbed over how Mr. Forrest, of course he's not here right now, and uh, was, was discussing about the rates for the attorneys. Um, and then I start thinking about different things that he's voted for, which had no, 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 no I couldn't see how he negotiated anything. Matter of fact, think of the Keisha farm. You had, a, you had an appraisal for $1.7 million, and he and his team ended up going at $2.4 million. Okay, Mr. Young. Now, to me, there's something screwy with what he's saying. He's, tonight, he's saying one way, but in okay. his actions, he has been totally the other way. And the citizens should know about that. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. You don't like that, huh? Not that I don't like it, unfortunately. The time is up. So Good there night. will be next meeting. Next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Young. Anybody else? More. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you.